Tato, welcome back. Day two of our deliberations meeting on the 10-year plan. We're going back now. Cast your minds back to item seven, curbside collection options on page 29 of your agenda. Uh, welcome Mr. Drew and Mr. Henderson on his feet. Happy to take questions. <laughs> questions, councillors. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Your Worship. Always good to start the day first. Um, thanks for what's a comprehensive report. Um, my main question is around um, the, the food waste bin itself. Um, and the question refers to the potential of opting out of that, not in a financial sense, but for a lot of people, we read it in submissions, people who don't want extra bin clutter. So, for example, they already compost at home. Is that logistically possible or does it just create too many contrary logistical problems not to actually deliver the bin if we do decide to vote with this option? Um, yeah, it does create quite a few logistical differences in the fact that we're then... Um, we could potentially not deliver the bin, but that would, uh, but that would, without actually changing the targeted rate. Uh, but I would imagine if people don't want the bin, then they'll expect there to be a different targeted rate as well. And then we start to get into that logistical nightmare of having to have multiple levels of, of, of rate in, in that regard. Um, but there, if people don't want to use the bin, obviously we can't force them to use the bin. Mr. Logie is reaching for his microphone. Yep. <laughs> Just in case, okay. He saw yeah, it. I he mean, heard rates. Th th thank you for the answer, but I don't, I don't know if I was really clear on what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not suggesting there's any ability from anyone to, to even attempt to claim any rebate in terms of paying. I'm happy for people to pay. So I'll use my example, I'm happy to pay. I just don't want the bin. Will there be an option for me not to have the bin? More than happy to pay for that bin, but I don't want it at my house. Uh, yeah, the, so as part of the rollout of a new service, we would have to have a mechanism where people, people can select the size of bin that they want. Uh, I can't see any particular reason why we couldn't have a option there if people do not want the bin delivered, as long as it's clear that that doesn't create any, uh, any impact on the targeted rate. I can't see why we can't make that work. Councillor Milley. Thank you, Bishop. That actually brings up a pretty similar question, and that is um, if we go for option one, for example, um, are the size of those bins at the moment fixed, or will, as we go through the um, rollout and the curbside pickup, because 23 litres is a fairly large bin for the food scraps, so is it possible that as we get into the future design, those bin sizes might change, not, not away from the consultation, but just as a practical rollout? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we haven't. The actual final design of the system would have to be in conjunction with whoever we've got on on board to actually deliver the system. Um, in most cases, for example, just using the orcs on the example, there's actually a small food caddy bin that you use actually in your kitchen, and the then the major collection bin outside. Um, so there would be the potential for that to to become a different sized bin. Um, depending, you know, in consultation with whoever's actually delivering the service and their recommendations. Thanks. And then with the timing of the new services, we're looking um, basically sometime um, next year as the start of the design. Um, what was, will the community groups who have a, a, an active interest in diversion and um, treatment of green waste be able to contribute to the um, to the post pickup design component so that when the curbside pickup has occurred, um, if the trucks are, for instance, operating in a section of town where there's a community group doing green waste, they may end up going there instead of to a central facility. Will that be able, will the community be involved in that step? Um, I can't answer that precisely now. What I can say is that the intention is for, we have a fairly, um, uh, restricted contract model at the moment, the intention is for the new contract model to be far more cooperative and partnership approach, which will enable 
um, things like community groups and that kind of stuff to actually ha um, be involved um, in areas where they, where they can. So the intention is to enable that kind of stuff to occur, yes. So yeah, can I ask that question slightly differently just so I'm sure there'd be no impediment, uh, sorry, there'd be no objection from staff with there to be direction from <coughs> council to actively work with interested community groups in helping design the diversion system over the two years we've got before it kicks off in mid-23? Uh, no, no, absolutely no objection. Um, it will, obviously, we need to get a partner on board so that they can be involved in that, but no, no objection from staff. Thank you. Councillor Hulahan. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to warm up. Hopefully I'm going to... Oh, no. I'm already warm. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, can I just check, please, um, uh, going back to really, I suppose, Councillor Walker's question, but with the other bins, because there were some people who presented, particularly the older man who couldn't walk very well up his hill, and he said it was like Baldwin Street, which I don't think was quite like Baldwin Street, but almost, but it was really steep. It is a valid point, actually, because Mum has quite a long drive too, and I know... I think the guys pick hers up and take them up, which is great, but I'm sure they don't do that for everyone. Um, you know, if he's got four or five bins, he said he couldn't even fit them by his door and couldn't fit into his house past the bins if he had them all there. Is there an option that if people live on their own like that, have a steep section and aren't actually capable of pulling all the bins up or don't have anywhere to store it, that they could just get one bin or, you know, could they have an option. I think that's what might be needed here is opt in or opt out for the bins and I know that's tricky but I think it's asking quite a lot of particularly elderly people, you know, when they... Has any consideration been given to people with particular access issues in managing the bin system at, a, at the collection point? Uh, the, the main way we address it is with the assisted collection service, which we currently won't run, which is basically if uh, there's a medical, medical certificate that uh, basically says that people have limited mobility, um, we pay an extra fee to the contractor and they will actually go to the house and collect the bins themselves. So that man uh, could, could say, look, I can't get it, and then he'd have to pay a bit more and they'd pick them all up. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, he doesn't have to pay any more. We... Uh, with, on the, we get a medical certificate, he applies for the service, um, our contractor charges the DCC a bit more, but we um, collect the bins from the house. Oh, I see. Okay, that's great. So he says, I've got an issue, and that's, so that's the way we could get around that, just everyone has to have all the bins, do they? There's no flexibility with that. Council, it's probably a bit premature given we haven't made a decision about what the bin system is going to look like yet. I know, but talking on the, the, propos on the, the proposal proposed was that would be option. Yeah. yeah. Just trying to clarify in my mind, like you were before on the other question, you know, like just exactly what would happen in that situation. The intention be under the new contract for that service to be continued, Mr Henderson? Yes, correct, yep. Yeah. Could I ask another question around the composting? How do you propose that that will work? It'll go back to the waste area and then be compost, the council will compost it, is that the case? The company who's got the contract will compost it. Uh, so the intention is for the curbside and the resource recovery services to be combined under one contract. So uh, once again, talking about a partnership arrangement, so the collection contractor will um, be involved in actually construction of a composting facility, depending on what, what's required, depending on the decisions of council on the 10-year plan. Um, we obviously have put funding in the draft capital budget yep. for a composting, composting facility or facilities. Um, yeah, so in partnership with the arrangement, there'll be a, a uh, separate depending on decisions, uh, either separate food and uh, garden waste composting or possibly combined. Yeah. And will that compost be available for the public or will Parks and Rec use it or how will that work? Uh, at the moment we've left it with the contractor to actually find the markets, um, but obviously we have departments within council that could uh, use that if, um, if it was suitable for them to use, then it would be available. Okay, thank you. So uh, it's a particular question about your assisted collection program. Given that the curbside collection service is funded by way of a targeted rate, where does that additional money come from? Does that come out of the general rate? Uh, so basically, and that's um, obviously as you're aware, we're increasing this, the cost of the 
uh, the targeted rate at the moment, so that all of those contract costs um, for the curbside collection are covered by that targeted rate. Great, got it. Thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Worship. Um, in your report, you'd make some mention of the PAYT technology, and I understand the tension and all of this between incentivising minimisation as well as providing an efficient and cost-effective, hopefully, service. Are you in a position to um, ensure, as part of the first round of contracts of, for whatever we go with, that you'll be able to require the contractor to install technology yet to be refined to enable the PAYT technology if it works? Um, confident that we will be able to include that in the contract documents that once it's, uh, that, that when that technology becomes proven and available that we'll be able to transition into that, yes. Um, but not confident that you can run a flag up the mast in the first round of contract should this technology become available it will need to be renegotiated and installed as part of those contracts. Um, sorry, I'm confused when you're saying part of those. Well, I'm just saying it, it, PAYT is being developed here and there, but it's not functional yet anywhere as I understand it, but it's something that might solve some of the issues that are being traversed here. Um, so I'm concerned that we don't get stuck in the first round, first contract cycle without any capacity to make an improvement should they be available. Uh, yeah, um, no, we did... I can assure you that we will definitely intend to include in the contract, the, and that's part of the, the partnership approach you want to take is that as improvements to, because um, there's also changes coming from central government in regards to products for collection as well. Right. So we want to make it a flexible contract that we can adjust and okay. change that's as good. we go through. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Malley. Um, to my knowledge, the council has not yet made a position on pay as you throw technology. So are we are acknowledging that as we go forward and, and, and keep monitoring this technology, it is in the situation of the fact that the council has not yet made a position on whether we're going to use it or not. C correct. There's a council resolution to bring back a report on, on pay as you throw technology. I'm aware of the resolution. Um, just along that same line, um, the um, waste levy that sits at landfills now was designed to act as a negative driver to, um, as part of, part, of, part of its activity was to be a negative driver to um, weight dumping or, or using a landfill, is that correct? Yes, correct, it's supposed to be a price driver to drive uh, behaviour change. Yes. And what has happened to volumes of landfill use over that period of time? Uh, since the waste levy was, or the waste minimisation act was introduced, waste to landfills been going up across the country, 3.4% uh, every year. Thank you. So effectively, it hasn't stopped. It. Uh, not yet. That is part of the driver for MFE increasing the waste levy up to $60 a ton from the current level of $10 a ton. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Worship. Um, Mr Henderson, just two small practical matters, uh, because we'll be having a new bin system, whatever we choose, um, and they were raised in submissions, and they were the, the clip and the lid. Was there any further thought around a lid for the glass bins in particular in the North Dunedin area? Was that a viable possibility? Uh, no, we haven't actually put any thought towards lids for the glass bin, no. What about um, clips on the, um, the wheelie bins? Um, I know there was mention of that or requests for that. Was there any thought put into the practicalities of that at all? Uh, last, last year we actually ran a trial in preparation for, uh, knowing we had the contracts coming up, obviously we ran a trial in a number of windy suburbs last year. Um, to select the right type of clip that actually would unlock when the truck tipped the bin um, and we have found one that worked uh, very well. So there is just a little clip that goes on the handle that uh, latches the bin closed for windy weather. Our intention is to roll that out on all bins in the new service. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Walker and Councillor Elder. Uh, yeah, back to food waste. Um, may surprise many of you around the table to know that a third of the world's food production actually is wasted 
and that New Zealand, as you guys will know, is a signatory to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which I think aims to cut food waste by 50% by 2030. Therefore, is, are you funded, um, if we vote to bring in this model, are you funded, uh, I guess, to do waste audits, to collect, to collect data either to prove that the concept here is working and or to inform future decision making? Uh, so, as part of our um, mandated six yearly review of the WMMP, we have to do a, a solid waste analysis, solid waste analysis protocol on waste coming into the landfill. So, at least every six years, we have to um, analyse the waste streams coming into the landfill as part of our business as usual. I guess a further question then, anecdotally, in other jurisdictions throughout the world when they bring in waste collection, it tends to result in quite a large decline in food waste, I guess because people are cognizant of waste. I was just wondering, other than that, that audit you're alluding to, internally are we planning to do any auditing specifically around the food waste? Because if we vote for this it will be a new, I guess, a new arm to it. Uh, well, we have the historical data which tells us that we've got a, at least 11,000 tonnes of food waste coming into Green Island each year, um, so we'll be able to obviously do a direct measurement against that um, to the amount that we're actually collecting, and, and depends on the particip participation rate of residents, we'll know how much of that has been diverted to a composting facility. Councillor Elder. Sorry for lateness. Um, so, a couple of questions. Um, a number of people said they're very efficient and they would be like to be rewarded by having a series of smaller bins, especially as, say, there's only one person in the household or two people in the household, having smaller p bins and being able to pay f less for that because they're producing less waste. Is that an option or has anybody else used that option? I think that was kind of traversed earlier, so you're, it's a rating question, so I might throw to Gavin, but you're, you're paying for a service um, and it gets challenging um, if you're paying for different levels of service. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So remembering that we're going to charge this through the rating system, so what you're paying is the availability of the service. If you wanted to go down to a very discretionary model, then that would have to be done differently because obviously when you strike your rates, that's then in place for the 12 months. So you would have to have a, a, a user, effectively a user pay system if, you, if that was the approach that Council wished to take. Okay, and, and, and you've got two different streams. You've got um, vegetable waste from cooking and, and um, um, food waste from leftovers, then you've got the um, green waste from the garden, um, and those two need to be treated quite differently as it's creating compost. So what, with the garden waste, um, what kind of technology is there available to actually take away all the risks associated with compost from garden waste with, say, oxalis and convolvulus and ivy and all the rest of it? Um, so that's one of the reasons for pro pro proposing um, separated collections is the fact that the, obviously the Food waste is a form of a better way, it's a higher quality material that produces that can be composted to produce a much better result. It will need the addition of some garden waste in a particular ratio for carbon to assist with the process. Um, so in regards to the garden waste itself, that's one of the reasons for out at Green Island at the moment we windrow compost the garden waste. We don't allow any lawn clippings to actually be included in that because that can normally contains a significant amount of um, uh, weed killer, broadleaf weed killers and that kind of thing. Um, but that material is, uh, creates a low grade, for want of a better word, pretty much just ground cover, just mulch. Um, so that, that we, don't even, uh, we don't try and use that as a compost material, whereas uh, something that's majority food waste can go through a hot rock compost system and actually produce a good quality compost that's suitable for gardens uh, in the high temperature uh, used in the composting system will kill pathogens or anything else in there. Um, 
garden waste is normally very contaminated. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, thanks, Chris. Um, look, there's a couple of questions. I, I just want to clarify what the implications of this will be for the current bin suppliers around the town, likes of waste management. I'm not sure who else all does it. I don't know the names of the companies, but the assumption is that they will lose a lot of business if we set this up. Uh, so, I mean, obviously they still be a... Um, it will depend on the, uh, on the uptake of service. People will still have the option of main, keeping a private bin if, they, if the current service doesn't meet their needs. There will still be the commercial providers that we don't... Commercial uh, 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 industry that we don't provide a service to. Um, assumption is that obviously one of the current providers will actually get the, job. The, count, yeah. get the job as council's partner. Yeah, but I guess what I'm trying to ask is the no one's going to be able to completely opt out of the entire service, are they? The service will be installed to every household within the city boundary, close city. So, so effectively, no one's going to want to pay for two bins. They might as well dump the other company as opposed to sticking with the status quo. They might as well, if they're going to pay for it through council, they will presumably use that service, most likely. Uh, yeah, well, I can't. I can't give you figures on how many people will opt in, but I guess is, there is an assumption that most people will um, use a council service. But but we're not giving them a choice to opt in. I, as in, I mean, it even will, though even if we provide the they... service, that doesn't mean that people have to use it. Oh no, 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 that's right. But they will have to pay for it. Mm. Yeah. The other the other question mm. I just had a wee bit about, and it's just sort of coming back to Councillor Walker's earlier questions, but it's is there any way? Or is it just going to be an ongoing business? To, to truly change behaviour, if that's what we want and if that's what we're, we're being told to by government, and I think it's sensible to reduce waste, when I look at these bins, I still sort of sit there and I think like plastic wastes, that, that bin there would take me a whole year to fill on, on based on sort of last year. Um, glass I might fill once, green waste I compost myself, food waste I compost, and general waste I'd probably fill one... 180 litre bin, maybe two a year at the very tops. I'm just wondering, is there any way that we can incentivise a true reduction by some price signalling, or is that just impossible to do? Um, it's very hard to do uh, as it stands at the moment without having a fully developed pay-as-you-throw or that sort of system to be able to implement um, to do that at the, at the moment would probably, in, uh, if we had a lot of selections of bins, different charging regimes, it would be having to, to audit, uh, it would just be a very difficult system to try and administer and, and, and imp even implement. Um, but advances in technology will hopefully take that, um, will make that far easier for us to implement. So you're expecting that uh, what Councillor Benson Pope was asking, when we do get that uh, tagging systems on bins that we can actually measure every kilo that's taken out of a place long term that would be where you'd aim to go do you think? Uh, wouldn't be able to measure every kilo that's probably the next step after that the first step would be just uh, if you put your bin at the curbside you get charged for its collection if you don't put it out you don't get charged Councillor Hall Would it be right that the biggest part of the cost is actually setting up the collection for the running of the trucks and everything, not so much the quantity of rubbish they pick up? So yeah, we dwell, we dwell on the, the quantity that people are putting out. So whether they put out one kg of rubbish or a, a full 240 litre one, the cost of running those trucks is the biggest part of the collection. Uh, yeah, there is a risk, obviously, that um, you could have a truck circulating the, the city on a particular day of the week and not picking up any bins. But you still got to pay for that. But you still got to pay for that truck to be out there yep. doing, doing the rounds in case there is a bin. Yeah. So that, that, that vo the volume of waste um, really becomes immaterial for the collection side. It's just for the dis disposal side of it. Yes, correct. Yeah. Councillor Reddick. 
uh, given that we're moving away from a user pay system to this uh, levy across the board, uh, what is your ex yeah, expectation on the volume of waste that we're going to collect uh, under this new system versus what we collect now? Uh, it's very hard to give you any sort of figure for that because we don't have uh, information from the private service providers. So I can't give you an accurate guess on that. Thank you. Councillor Council Walker. Uh, thank you. Um, just a, another question that's come to mind while we've been talking. Um, if we were of a mind to, to go for the four bins plus one, is it, is it your opinion that this will in many ways go a long way to helping rest back control of the waste stream system, which I guess has been slowly and continuously eroded by private contractors? Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't want to give an opinion, um, the councillor, sorry. Councillor Lofiso. Tēnā koe, Your Worship. Tēnā kōrua. I, I think this question is um, possibly for His Worship or the CE, because I remember uh, in the last triennium when Mr Henderson was talking to us about the next landfill, I was naive thinking, why would we need a landfill, thinking that we were going to do the work to reduce rubbish? So uh, long term... Whose job is it to lobby manufacturers or central government about packaging? Because as a cook in, in my household, there's so much soft packaging and crap that we don't have anywhere to, you know, reduce or whatever. The short answer is it's a political problem. Um, and we have over years individually and collectively lobbied around um, in concepts like mandatory product stewardship. And packaging is on the list, but they're working backwards from the most toxic things as opposed to the most prevalent things, with starting with tyres and paints and batteries and so on. But um, yeah, until until the waste gets designed out of the system, it's not going to make our job any easier. No. Councillor Melly, I'm happy to move option one. You wish. Thank you. Are there further questions before? our learned officers depart. Councillor Gary. This is a little bit off the wall question, but it's something that I've noticed in the submissions. Um, there's a huge change in people's attitude to uh, waste um, from years ago. Um, but, uh, but only in a section of our community there are still people we need to take on the journey. My question is around the psychology of it. How, how important, or is that an element of um, the work that you've done to date around the psychology of changing behaviours? Uh, so the Waste Men's Forum, obviously our, our industry body, um, has a group dedicated to behaviour change. Um, it's an ongoing battle trying to, very much an ongoing battle trying to actually reach everyone and get the message across. The simple fact of the matter is that when, when you've finished using something, it has no value to you. Um, and it's trying to actually, the, the, there is quite a generational gap there where uh, I would say that younger people get it a lot better than the older generation, that it just because you've done using it, it still uh, has, a, has a value, it still uh, has a disposal path. Um, suffice to say there is, there is ongoing work uh, on how to try and get the message across and, and get better uh, impact in society. Excellent, thank you. Um, just before we get to... Oh, sorry, Councillor Wiley. Yeah, it was just a question for um, for Mr Logie. One of the other resolutions of Council was how we fund this, and Council asked for work to be done on whether the targeted rate could be progressive as opposed to a flat rate. When would we anticipate seeing something back around... I mean, acknowledging the system was years away still, but... When would we see that work? So my recollection is that that was to inform the 22-23 annual plan. I said next. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, yep. with decisions at this time next year, presumably. Okay, that's fine. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, just for clarity, from I'm trying to get my head around the um, the food waste and the garden waste, and the number of submissions that we saw around community groups really want to taking a greater lead in this. Is that a really is that an option? Is that something that could is doable? And you know, should we vote down option one and go to the purely three bin and invest more time with the uh, community groups to do this in the local areas? Um, it's certainly an option. Um, however, at the moment, I would say that the only uh, real community group that we're seeing that are actively trying to get into it is back in, is Wakawaiti. Um, there's only one group so far that are actually really organised. We've we have given them space, etc., up there so that they can actually start creating their own um, facility for resource recovery. Um, there isn't. There are, that, that model is not repeated across the city at all at this point in time. Um, but, there, so but there are a number of interested parties working around food waste and green waste collection. Yeah, there's a number of interested parties, um, and we've been helping develop those through the Waste Minimisation Grant. Um, they're all uh, small scale, um, I think is the issue, and it would need to increase significantly to handle um, the amount of food waste that would come out of the waste stream in Dunedin. But, but we're going to be putting a lot of money into the extra two bins, or the extra uh, food waste bin, and for those that want to pay for an extra green waste bin, uh, and um, would we not get a better bang for our buck if we worked with and invested with the community groups um, in, in those areas? And because I would think there's also a greater residual around education um, across the community through those groups. Uh, I couldn't speak to the point about a better bang for your buck. Um, a professionally run facility would obviously create a, a, a good product. Um, there would obviously be some benefit to that community-based approach, but as I say, it would have to, and we do invest in those groups through the Waste Minimisation Fund already, or through our Waste Minimisation Grants. Um, all I would say is it would need to be a massive uplift, uplift in that activity before it could actually um, solve that problem for us. And, and you don't see those as mutually exclusive, I assume? Yeah. Councillor O'Malley. I think I'll just cover it. And fine. Councillor Marker. Just have a question around the key dif differences and the advantages and dis disadvantages of option one and option two. And I just want to check in that um, our waste stream is responsible for around 8% of our carbon emissions. Is that correct? Uh, of Dunedin City, it's about yeah, about seven or eight percent. Yes. And the key difference between option one and option two, it says here that the uh, strongest alignment with the DCC waste futures towards a circular economy program, which estimated an overall twenty-seven percent reduction in annual waste to landfill. Is that covering basically the food and the green waste? Yeah, predominantly the, the predominantly the food waste. We already have the green <coughs> green waste drop off facility, um, so it's predominantly talking about food waste. And then that, that follows on to say that it would have a twenty four percent reduction in associated annual carbon emissions. Would that be correct? Yes, correct. Yep. Okay, thank you. Councillor O'Malley, we're all yours. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think when we're looking at option one versus the other options and where we're heading towards this with our programs, we have to look at the problem that we are trying to solve here. Um, one of them is that um, organic material is going to the landfill and that's causing uh, methane production at the landfill and therefore not meeting our carbon neutral targets along with the fact that we're also accruing quite heavy um, carbon trading costs in the process of doing it. The other one is the loss of the control of the waste stream. Um, it is true that there are other providers right now who are providing um, cost, more cost effective options than we are through our black bag and therefore people have gone to their red bins. The provision of the red bin and the rate as we're going to provide it will effectively mean that every household has one. The cost of administering it is similar to what Enviro, um, Enviro Waste is charging for their red bin when you put it into the whole cost thing. 
The other component is that those, that, so, and by doing so, we have a strong anticipation that we will move back to controlling most of the household waste that comes from the city. Now, the relevance of that is that we still have poor regulation around landfills and what goes into landfills, and our municipal landfill is the one that's giving the best outcomes. So this is a very important upstream activity for us to make sure that we are controlling things correctly to get the outcomes we're looking for. We also have an aim of zero waste. By removing the food waste from the general waste bin, we effectively make that bin much cleaner. And that means that in the future we have the potential to go back through and do diversion with that bin as well. So over time, as this gets more sophisticated, we should be moving further and further and further towards a zero waste outcome. The separation of food waste from garden waste has been traversed a fair number of times. Garden waste can contain chemicals in it which therefore make the material no longer of use to those who want the product. Food waste has a very high organic content to it and produces a high grade material. So therefore separating those two apart makes sense. Um, the commentary has been made about opt-in and opt-out and pay-as-you-go. I think proponents of that are sometimes do not take into account that there are additional costs that go with that as you start heading along those lines. If someone, for instance, chooses to opt out of the food waste bin and then starts putting their food waste in the red bin, then they have completely contaminated that bin system again and we have gone back to square one. How do we, do, how do we ensure that won't happen? We'll have to put in more stringent policing and then there'll be fines that will have to go with it. So opt in and opt out, bring with you things that you may not necessarily consider. Councillor Hall had pointed out a fact when it comes to pay as you throw technology. The truck is still driving down the road whether you're using it or not. And if you go to pay as you throw and only one quarter of the bins are out any one time, your throw cost will go up about three to fourfold. So your cost per household will probably not change that much whether we do it as a general fee or that we do it as a pay as you throw technology. Every time we have gone to these user pay systems, we have tended to find ourselves putting expenses in the system that don't in any way cover what you think you're saving because you think you're using it less often than others. Hearing the quality of everybody's um, handling of waste in this, or, um, this room, I would think that if everybody in the city was as good as us, we wouldn't even need a landfill. However, we clearly do because we clearly get this material coming in in these quantities. This system that we're putting in place is not to, to meet the requirements of every single individual in the city. It is to meet the general city behaviour as we see it and how do we deal with it as a general activity. And in this regard, this is state of the art at the moment. In terms of what we do with those materials later, it's important that we do the separation at the point of pickup because that determines the processing from that point on. So, we have got on this curbside pickup system the best method for then determining that if a community group such as the Waikawaiti North Coast group get together with a good green facility, we can take it to their facility to be processed there. The rest of it will go to some other facility that we will build in. Over time, people will come up with each of these parts. How do we deal with stuff in the yellow bin? We are supposed to, under a waste minimisation and management plan, to develop local technologies and develop local abilities to perform functions that are associated with these materials. So to Mr Henderson's point about the other units, the other community groups not being fully ready yet, that's accepted, but it's actually our responsibility under the WMMP to develop those community groups and make them able to interface with our systems. So I think this is state of the art. I really am not a fan of opt-in, opt-out because I think it has perverse outcomes that will, cause, that will undermine the ability to achieve the outcomes we're trying to look for. Um, and I'm hoping that this is a unanimous vote on this one. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you to the mover and thank you to Mr Henderson and all his team for the work on this uh, over quite a, quite a long period. Um, we definitely need a new system and as Councillor Romali says, we definitely need to wrest back control of a waste stream that continues, it appears, to be eroded by private con contractors. That's the reason I support um, for Burns Plus One and why I seconded it. And of course this, um, this, this option is supported by the majority of people who submitted uh, during the, the submission process. Um, it also of course has 
I think by far the strongest alignment to our circular economy goals set out in our Waste Futures programme, and it certainly has the highest alignment with our thriving cities and city uh, uh, portrait strategic goals. Um, as I mentioned in the question time, collecting food waste has multiple, multiple benefits, not least of which is highlighting to households the ridiculous amount of food waste uh, they are wasting an ongoing tragedy in most of the developed world. Um, I guess perhaps having the amount of food th you throw out, looking at you every week in the face uh, each week may finally be a wake-up wake call for many, for many residents, hopefully leading to behavioural change and actually having an ultimate cost savings to, to, to families and the environment. Um, we also heard through submissions quite regularly, actually verbally and written submissions, a large number of appeals from people not wanting to pay for things they don't use, such as, I don't produce much waste, why should I pay for it? Or, I do all my composting at home, why should I bear the cost of those who don't? I'm one of those people. My wife and I currently only put out two black bags per year. I've bored you all by telling you that. And we, have, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I'll continue doing it. I will not remain silent. We also have a worm farm and about three other compost uh, piles around our property. But I'm privileged, and this is not, this, what we're voting on today is not about individuals like me. It's about what is good, what is, what is the collective good for this city. I don't have children, but the majority of my, my tax that I pay goes, goes to those to schools. I think it's a good idea that, that, that we have good schools in New Zealand. I haven't spent a night in Dunedin Hospital. That's where the second largest amount of my tax money goes. But I think it's a good idea we have hospitals. Um, I think similarly, I'm in the top, yes, Councillor O'Malley, I'm in the top percentile around this table when it comes to being very diligent about the waste I create. But I'm happy to support and pay for a system that makes it a little easier for everyone to be a little better at, at feeding into our circular economy of goals. And let's keep those, those goals in mind. Um, as I've just said, it's about the collective good. It's about the well-being of everyone who lives, lives in Otaputi Dunedin. We've already shown this this week, yesterday in fact, by choosing to support community <coughs> housing, that we are a progressive, forward-thinking city that thinks about the benefits and well-being of everybody above and beyond individualism. I'm a wee bit nervous. There's been a wee bit of talk around the table. I know it's not proposed here. I am a wee bit nervous to move towards a pay-as-you-throw system, as you will undoubtedly be aware, as I've mentioned before, that this is very likely to impinge disproportionately on those people less able to pay, very much in the same way that water meters have been proven to, to do throughout the world. Um, thanks, Mr. Henderson, to you and the Waste Environment Solutions teams for f working on finding solutions to this enduring problem. And if this motion passes, I wish you well in the procurement, procurement process and look forward to the new system when it arrives. Thank you. Further speakers. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll be supporting this motion. Uh, what comes to mind is we're late already, and I think for many people in our community, that's how they feel about um, getting rid of the black bags, but this is where we're at, this is what we have to deal with in terms of timing and the contracts. I was pleasantly surprised through the submissions, and maybe that was about the people who chose to engage with us, um, about the level of awareness uh, about reducing waste, um, the level of composting that people spoke of, uh, and that was through all age groups. Um, and, and I think that was very affirming around the direction we're going uh, in, but we also had people who really didn't get the bigger picture um, and opposed it, but they were smaller in numbers. There is certainly a challenge for those with limited mobility and for older folk, and it was good to hear Mr Henderson articulate the assisted collection service, which possibly isn't well known in our community. But for older people in our community, um, the larger number of bins is a challenge. 
uh, and uh, that is something we need to be aware of. I don't think it was probably helped by the 23 litre weekly food waste bin in the picture looking like it was bigger than the glass recycling in terms of the um, rendition of the pictures. But uh, for anyone that took notice of, of that, um, they would have realised it was a smaller caddy. Um, food waste, I agree with Councillor Walker that when you're looking it in the face, um, then you, you're aware of the waste you're creating. And I certainly was aware of this. I think if you go camping or tramping and you have to carry out your waste, uh, you suddenly are very uh, confronted and aware of the different kinds of waste that you have. I've certainly noticed a um, gathering of momentum with the waste minimisation grants uh, that we consider on the grant subcommittee. And it's good to see the community initiatives uh, coming through. Um, they've got a ways to go yet, but certainly they're gathering in momentum. Um, what we decide today will be part of a suite of other decisions, some of which are beyond our control, the um, packaging stewardship issues that Councillor Lefiso spoke of, um, where there aren't a lot of options in terms of purchasing goods. Um, and often, if you're purchasing at the kind of stores that do offer it, they're very, very expensive. Um, it's also uh, going to be part of a packaging of, of a, a package of, of other initiatives like composting initiatives, and it will also give opportunities in local processing um, projects that may happen. What it doesn't include is issues around demolition, and, and I can't put my hand up and say that uh, I'm doing well at all in our household around that. It, it really pains me to see the amount of demolition material that goes out and is not diverted. But in terms of this motion and this initiatives, th this is about the greater good, this is about leadership, um, and uh, I believe this is the way we need to go. It's not soon enough, but it's what we, it's the timing we have to deal with, and there's no question for me that this is what we need to be voting on. And, and I, like Councillor O'Malley, hope that it is a unanimous decision that we make today. Thank you, Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I can support this. So I guess I just want to make a clarification, just in case Councillor Walker was, was thinking that I was um, wanting to make this user pays. What I'm trying to do is drive waste minimisation, and I thought that the way that... I, I still believe that is one way that you might achieve that. Now, if we have all totally separate bins, the other way is we send it all to Mr Henderson and he just minimises it. He, he can send it through magnets to pull the metal out and you know do whatever with all the different componentry, and it doesn't necessarily all go to waste. What I'm trying to do is just stop it in the stream before that. So um, whether or not that's the best way to do it, I, I don't have an opinion. I was just asking the question, so I can support this. Thank you. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Worship. Well, first, I am going to be extremely happy not to have to clean up after a dog or cat has ripped up my plastic bag and scattered the food waste all over the street. It will also be a lot easier for me to dispose of broken glass. Light bulbs, broken glass, at the moment, you have to wrap them very carefully and you're always worried that when the bag is picked up, the operator might cut himself. So I think this move is essential to get rid of that risk. I also firmly believe that we should be using the resource that goes out as food waste. We waste a lot of food in this country and, and we need to try and stop doing that, but at least we won't waste it completely if we compost it and use that material again. I'm a little bit concerned about the green waste bin size, which probably means that I'm going to have to stop fertilising my lawn because currently in the grow, growing, the peak of the growing season, I almost fill my 240 litre general waste bin with grass clippings so uh, perhaps it's a good thing that I'm, I will have to reduce fertilising the lawn, but I certainly support this an option. For the speakers. Councillor Wiley. Um, I guess, um, sorry Councillor Malley, but I won't be supporting uh, option um, B. Um, and 
for me, it is about listening to a lot of the submissions. And I think, to take it one step back, at the January 27th meeting, I would have actually supported the status quo if I knew what I knew now from reading the submissions. So that was not what we were consulting on. We were consulting on whether we went to four bins plus one or three bins. So I have to go for what's in front of me. I do note the amount of submissions around what the people wanted and what they commented on. I also, as I put the question, supported community programs to be a, a more supported and funded with waste and um, garden, food waste and garden waste. The part that I actually was heartened to hear, which was new information to me, was the fact there is going to be the opportunity for people with medical certificates to get service to get their bins. And I think that was missing from any other information I'd heard previously. I'm, I'm sorry if it had been raised, but I hadn't heard it and I don't think the public were aware of it. I also would follow up on the comment from Councillor Gary that I think it didn't help with the imagery that we have in the sense of the food waste bin being 23 litres and a glass recycling bin being 45 litres and the size of the bins. But again, I look at sticking with a three bin option and not going to a four plus one. But I guess at the end of the day, the success or failure of this program will be how many food waste bins we see sitting out on the curbside on a weekly basis in the coming years. Excuse me, Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I will be supporting this, although I do have serious concerns for elderly people and people, the lady who came and talked to us um, during the hearings who lives in an apartment block and talked about how, you know, they've got I don't know, maybe 19, 20 different units or whatever, say for example, and a small wee area, she said, we just haven't got the room for all these bins. And I know the area where we've got down the side of a house and our section is quite large. There's not a lot of area where I've got, where I normally put the bin to even put it in our place. So I don't know how someone in a little wee, um, and certainly in a, in a high rise apartment building will fit all these bins. I think while we're trying to have, you know, we've got good intentions with doing this, and that's why I'm supporting it, um, I do think we're going to cause problems for elderly people, people with disabilities, people who live on their own, and people in small homes. That actually is a lot of people. Um, and I have to say that while I commend um, Councillor Walker, I, you know, I think... It's incredible, two rubbish bags in a year. I've never, I, I can can only dream of that. But I would say, Councillor Walker, that if he had children, I think he'd find his rubbish would increase a lot. <laughs> yes. Well, and also what Councillor Lafeso said around the wrapping, um, there's an awful lot of wrapping goes into kids' morning tea and afternoon tea wraps. Like, you know, we use all the um, recycle, you know, the you get little what are they called, lunch wraps. We use those where you use them and you wash them out and you, so it's not using the Glad wrap or the um, tin foil and things, although I do have those there and use them for some things. However, not for lunch. But um, my point is that children create a lot of rubbish, I have to say, and, and the, as companies do need to be very aware of what they're wrapping stuff in, and it does need to change because we have we would have one bag full of just their morning tea and lunch stuff that is their wrappings in there, and often they don't eat their lunch, and so that gets thrown in the rubbish as well. And so I was thinking when someone brought up the fact, I think it was Councillor O'Malley, that if one person puts that in their bin, then they're going to contaminate the whole thing. I thought, gosh, we'd do that one day a week, every day of the week, because the kids put all the, you know, their empty rubbish lunch boxes in there and half the time they don't eat half the stuff. So these do sound boring and silly. However, they are the real world for most people. And the story we heard, I oh know poor Councillor Walker's now crying, but the story we heard about Councillor Walker is not realistic or, or real in the real world. Um, it would be nice if it was, but the real world is people like me who have kids and run around and fill up bins and too much rubbish. So we do need to look at resolving this. Thank you. Councillor Barker. 
As well I am, as this musician said, waste isn't waste until we waste it. And I might suggest a self-wrapped morning tea called a banana, which would result in some waste minimisation. Um, I too have a child, and my child went to a school that had the Enviro Schools programme, and we are very concentrated on waste minimisation. Again, like Steve, in a privileged position with a worm farm, compost, etc. But I support option one, which enables all of our community to focus on our goals, our carbon zero targets. In the report, there's a, if it, we have a 27% reduction in annual waste. That leads to a 24% lowering in carbon emissions. Waste is 8% of our carbon emissions and something we can control. I also think that it would help extend the life of the landfill, and we have issues around our, our landfill filling up very fast. Um, and we must encourage people to um, minimise waste. Councillor O'Malley traversed all the, uh, the points very thoroughly. Uh, it was very discouraging to hear that waste to landfill is growing 3.4 per cent per year. We do have a serious problem here and we do need to address it. And I think that option one gives us the best way of addressing that. Councillor Elder. Um, I, I wore this dress partly today to talk about this. This dress is second hand, it comes from a second hand shop. Product stewardship, we have to pull all the levers to change what's happening in this world. Um, my children all have um, little plastic bags, but they're reusable. They reuse them all the time and make their own food and put them into those bags for their children. So we need to pull all the levers, and, and the, it is possible to reduce waste before it goes into the bin, like Mike Lord said. And we need to encourage that, and we need to educate people, and we do. We have those composting um, seminars, etc. So there is many, many ways which we need to talk about before the um, waste gets in those bins. But once the waste is in the bin, having the green waste and the vegetable waste enables us to separate that and use it and reuse it again by creating compost, by be creating opportunities for it to actually contribute to our community. And I went to a se seminar a couple of years ago and this guy in Christchurch uses chipped wood and green waste and puts um, native seed link, seeds in it and they spread it across the ground and it enables um, native um, plantings to survive. So there's many ways in which we can use that green waste to actually assist our city. Um, so I support this. I think having a red bin that people pay for that has everything in it isn't a good way to go. And so this enables us to actually separate the waste streams and effectively um, use it to actually contribute to um, our city and reduce waste. So I'm happy to support it. And I think, um, I think also, I think pay as you go, I agree with Jim, um, will actually adversely affect those who are least able to pay it. So I support um, a total um, collection which isn't pay as you go. Councillor Reddick. Well, nothing we've done so far, neither anything that the government has done, has decreased the amount of waste that the country is producing and has done very little to help with uh, recycling or diversion. So at least with going to this system, five bin system, people immediately get four, so an extra couple of bins to be thinking about where they're putting their stuff. And the hope is, and then we have a consistent levy across everyone in the population. I much prefer philosophically to have a user pay system. However, this way it does uh, put the one size fits all and pushes people to separate out their waste and if they get their food, weekly food waste bin, they might choose to recycle. They might choose to do some composting at home with that, uh, which would be a, an even better thing. Now that they've got a purpose-built bin to put it in and cart to the other end of the section, so I think we have to uh, be.
be doing something and separating it at source has got to be a big help with um, moving us towards a waste minimisation goal. And certainly the government is very keen for us to minimise that waste and uh, looking to increase by a magnitude of five or six, a magnitude of six, the minimisation levy. And thereafter, I believe they're looking to increase it again. So it's, uh, it's appropriate that we do something suitable that will help us achieve that. And that um, education that people will have in their own backyards will help us along that way. Thank you. Um, as much as I've enjoyed the parade of anecdotes, uh, I have no interest in people knowing what's inside my bins. Uh, it's why I prefer the discretion of cans uh, over those of glass bottles when it comes to curbside collection. Uh, but with regard to this, all I can say is finally, uh, and, and I think it's worth um, reflecting on the, the history of this service. When Council first introduced a curbside collection, they asked the question of the community whether or not they wanted an, an organic waste collection. They got close to 10,000 submissions, and the community was roughly split half-half um, as to whether or not we should introduce that, and the, the elected leadership of the day chose not to. And the result of that is that we're 15 years behind uh, in developing uh, at, a, at a civic level the, uh, the systems and the infrastructure to be able to deal with what is a, a, a liability for us financially and, and environmentally through the, um, the, 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 the methane that it creates. And in all the year, I mean, and, and I, in the, all the years between those decisions being made about the design of the original curbside collection system, and now there's been no shortage. In fact, an increasing um, tenor of feedback from the community that this is what we want, uh, this is what they want, and I, and I think our, both our community and this council has moved a, a long way since uh, since then. I do think this is a really uh, exciting opportunity, and I'm, uh, I'll move this as a subsequential motion to in, to involve what is now a very engaged community and, and helping to inform what these systems look like. It would be a, a massive missed opportunity, I think, to not, um, to not grab hold of that. Uh, and, and, and similarly, while I'm foreshadowing things, I, I, picking up on the point that was made earlier, I think we do need to consider um, in, the, in the design of the system how we deal with um, or consider alternatives for how, how we handle higher density residential uh, environments because that is something that other policies of council are trying to encourage, but it does become a live, it becomes a becomes problematic for the transport network uh, if every um, flat or every apartment in an apartment building all has all of their bins out on the side of the road uh, at the same time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to thank Councillor Sainz for raising uh, worker safety. Uh, it's it's been a big part of the feedback we've had from. Uh, from contractors certainly, and for people who are involved in this work, the, the, the black plastic bags of the status quo offer little protection, whether it's you know, syringes or broken glass or light bulbs or whatever. And, and I don't think we can, um, uh, I don't think we can continue down this route, and, and which is how we ended up with, you know, effectively, the status quo option through consultation still included a, a red lidded bin. Um, people have talked a, a bit about user pays uh, and and pay as you throw a technology. And I know that this isn't a decision that we're making now. And, and I mean, I'm, price price sensitivity is a curious thing. Um, it's what the intention of the waste levy has been to use price signals to drive behaviour change, and it hasn't worked. Uh, and suggesting that then just jacking up the waste levy further sounds a bit like market dogma to me. It's just we haven't gone far enough, and if we just keep increasing the price, then that will miraculously uh, drive a different outcome. Uh, because what happens with, I mean, it, it, it's likely to change the behaviour in people who are more price sensitive, and there aren't too many of them in this uh, in this room, but it, it means that for people uh, who are more price sensitive, it drives often perverse outcomes, whether that's through fly tipping or, um, or, or um, less than ideal use of the provision of, of services that we have. And I think when we get to having that debate this time next year, we need to be um, really conscious about what we are trying to achieve and, and avoiding um, the, the perverse, uh, avoiding those perverse outcomes. But 
great to see this. I'd love to see it in action before the middle of 2023. Um, but this is at least um, gives our community um, uh, reassurance that we are finally picking up on uh, all of the submissions that uh, they have uh, put down over years. And I thank them actually for their ongoing advocacy and, and the work that they have done in the vacuum that we have left. Uh, in, the, in the interceding years to, to pick up on some of these problems and with the limited resources they have available, try and uh, fix the problem. Um, but unless um, we provide the support and infrastructure uh, that as uh, Councillor O'Malley has indicated, we have committed to doing through the Waste Minimisation and Management Plan, then we're not gonna get the, uh, the ultimate um, outcome, either socially or environmentally. And, and I welcome the support for the resolution. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to first um, just comment on two councillors' comments. One is Councillor Gary's comment about um, construction and demolition. Um, that is a different waste stream and there is work going on on dealing with that as well. Um, and to Councillor Wiley's commentary on the three bin system or actually staying with the status quo, if we were to do, to do that then we are not meeting any of our carbon neutral targets because we would be deliberately choosing to mix organic material in with our current waste streams. So I don't think that would be a step forward. Um, there has been some commentary that, um, that the system has been eroded by private contractors. I feel that might be a little bit harsh on, on the people who we actually will be going back out to, to ask to deliver the system with us later. I more would say that we have actually failed to provide um, to our public an, an, an up up to standard and modern system and therefore we have started to lose control over it and by bringing this back we are bringing, we will get the control back. Um, there are fine points in the final design that will happen with the rollout of the program. As it's designed and talked about here, that is essentially to households that have plenty of space on them and other such things. But we have a couple of sections in the town that are quite different. We have some high density areas where there will have to be a different method by which we roll this out. And we also have low density, pop, pop, low population densities in the rural area where people have been using the black bag in the past. So we'll have to deal with those, those people's needs as well. Um, in terms of change induced by economic models that largely tended to fail to deliver, but we still are seeing significant changes in the way people uh, um, interface with these systems and what they think about their own waste, as people have sort of talked about themselves here. So we are seeing a social attitudinal change already folding out in front of us, and I think we just keep moving with that. Um, and this system, for it to work, to Councillor Houlihan's um, commentary about her children, it will still require that people interface with it correctly. We are providing the ability for you to do the right thing. It still does require for you to do the right thing at that point. And so now that you have an option of separating your lunch waste into both food waste and general waste, we would have an expectation that that's what households will do. And we will have to put into place a method for ensuring that that has happened in much the same way you do with the yellow bins now, making sure that people aren't putting general waste in those bins. Um, but the real point here is that all good systems require a good upstream sorting system to start with at the start. Otherwise, everything downstream of that is now compromised, and this is allowing us to achieve that. Um, the whole point about the green waste being collected in this way is it will be able to interface with community groups later, and they'll be getting the product in its right form before they go on to the next part. Um, we talk about waste minimisation as if it's always something we have complete control over, but often we are affected by external drivers. I was going to talk about my rubbish, but I won't now. Generally speaking, <laughs> but generally speaking, if you have done everything you can internally in your own system now to divert, which this system will allow you to do, you will find that the red bin is going to be essentially full of soft plastic. Um, and that is an external driver that nobody in the city has control over at the moment. We have to get to those external drivers as well. And I, list, I would liken this to building a wall where this is a cornerstone we're putting in. We have had a tendency not to build the wall at all because we can't put all the blocks in at the same time. What we've got to do is put it in one thing at a time. And this is a methodology for dealing with households and their, their challenge to do in the right thing and our interface with them. And I think this is the best that we can do. Um, And so the bottom line here is there will be those who are not going to be happy with the changes that are in, in front of them. But the majority of the people in the city will be served by this system as, as 
a good system and it will allow us to meet all of our downstream requirements later. If we don't do this, then we might as well forget all the other work we're doing because this is the inputs from the majority of the private inputs to the system. And this allows us to, to separate them out in such a way that we can then do the right thing by them later and meet our zero waste goals in the future. I'm hoping still for a unanimous vote. Thank you. I'm going to take A and then we'll take B by division. Uh, part A, to note the feedback. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Part B. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Aye. Councillor Aye. Elder? Yes. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Hall? Councillor Houlihan? Aye. Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? Aye. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandervis? No. Councillor Walker? Aye. Councillor Wiley? No. Your Worship? Aye. Motion carried 13 to 2. I'll move that we adjourn the meeting for five minutes so I can deal with the subsequent motion. Second, Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed.
And standing orders advisor. And so as as foreshadowed and for clarity, my intention is to get through this. And assuming there are no other uh, motions that come out of this paper, then um, we'll break more substantially for morning tea. Uh, is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Barker, thank you. Um, I've already spoken to it really. I just think it would be useful to have uh, on the work program um, a, a request to continue to work with, and in response to submissions really, we continue to work with various interested groups and in how we inform the design of the system, looking at alternative collection options for higher density residential areas, and that, uh, that will come through, progress will come back through the relevant committee, depending on what it is. Um, in due course as this work progresses over the next year or so. Um, further speakers? Well, it's probably a question, but you'll say you'll answer it later, but would we be able to just take note of the point that uh, Councillor O'Malley referred to at the end of a summing up, which was for some people in rural areas that currently use a black bag, just throw it in the car and take it to a central location point, like on the peninsula or around it out from whatever, how they would deal with that. Yeah, that, uh, as, uh, it, it may it, happen as part of. We that, may the, not. Yeah, the, the 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 rural collection work is already included, as, and it's it's made up. It's expressed in the in the consultation document. My, my, I know there are other issues other than higher density, higher density residential areas. It's just that we, we have been silent on that up until this point. And so just making sure that that's included along with the rural collection scheme seemed helpful. Councillor Houlihan. Could you just clarify number one, work with interested groups to inform the design of the resource division systems. What does that mean? It means people who have an interest in helping us to design the resource diversion systems are involved in discussions about how we design them. So outside, is that sort of external um, companies that already do it, so talk to them, is that what you're meaning, or uh, members of the public? It's quite high level, um, for good reason. So it could be community groups that are currently exist, it could be community groups that form around this co or right. it could be commercial enterprises. I don't want to limit who's involved in it, I just want to make sure that we cast the net as wide as we can and, and getting the best system design. No speakers. I'll put the motion on all those in favour. Aye. Those against, that's agreed. Uh, we'll move that we adjourn for morning tea. Aye. Seconded, Councillor Lofisso, thank you for your enthusiasm. Uh, and we will reconvene at uh, 10 past 11. All those in favour? Those against, that's agreed.
We're on item 11. Mr. Drew and Ms. Benson. Page 101 of the agenda. <laughs> Taking the paper as read. Correct, happy to answer questions. Questions, Councillor O'Malley. You worship, um, I'm also happy to move um, the item that is okay. on the papers at the moment. Um, I've got some questions around the level of design that we're at at the moment um, relative to what the budget items that we have. Um, and there's some commentary, like our parking management, which is on page 117 and finer detail. We've got 9.5 million allocated there. And some of the submitters um, said that's an awful lot of money for signs telling me what parking building to go to. Can you assure me that it's a little bit more than signs to a parking building. Correct, it is more than signs to a parking building. If you look at uh, page 117 and 118, the parking wayfinding system is just one of the four projects. So the parking wayfinding system is costed about 3.5 million. The other projects make up the balance. And in the parking wayfinding system, that is, um, that's real-time parking analysis. Does that include, um, it, that's really just the main parking buildings in town, right, at that price? Or is, or is there more to it, like sending you to a quadrant or an area like that? Are we going to do much in the way of real-time parking outside the parking buildings? It, yes, it includes car counting technology for likes of St Andrew Street and Tom Spoons. Um, and then likewise, just going on to um, Park and Ride, page 124, um, we've got 10.2 million um, for Burnside and Mosgill, and I note that both are only offering 180 car parks at the moment, which would be, I think, back envelope was $27,000 a car park. I assume those numbers will move as we get into greater design issues um, as relates to the number of cars that are coming from the south that we're trying to have some impact on. Yeah, as we go through the program business case, those numbers will move, yes. The last one is, it relates to the harbour arterial sort of on a more higher level component. If we move all that traffic down to the waterfront, we'll be creating a pedestrian barrier to the water, which is counter to one of our outcomes in terms of developing the waterfront. Are we doing the harbour arterial because in many respects there isn't really any other alternative when it comes to the level of funding that we're going to do, um, such as a western bypass or a grade separation of State Highway 1, which both would be in the hundreds of millions, so we are then left with the harbour arterial? Yes, we are doing the harbour arterial to get the traffic out of town. Um, yep. But the side effect will be that then there will be very high traffic movements right down on the waterfront. That's correct. Thank you. That's great. You're, you're moving that we we'll proceed with all of the options as outlined in the yes, paper? Yes, basically as outlined in the paper. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Benson Pope. Just some guidance, Mr Chairman, are we asking about the report or the Emma Cagney report or the whole lot? Uh, well, you, can, you, can, you can ask questions of whatever, whatever you like, but acknowledging the fact that staff, didn't, staff don't work for Cagney, nor did they write that, so responses that they may offer could be limited. That's fine, thank you. Um, first question then about, um, about the six options in respect of the projects and the community feedback. Um, five of them got really strong feedback as I read the figures in the report, the exception being the um, Princess Street Bus Priority Corridor. Do you, um, is, is it an issue of 
people not understanding what's proposed or a lack of clarity in the design to inform those choices or have you got any feel for why that seems to be the odd man out so to speak? Um, yeah, I think I think people have misunderstood um, what the project is about, councillor. So I think there's probably a little bit of work in explaining that to to them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the um, can I can I say thank you for the M R Cagney report? I've done my own reading about who they are, and they seem to be highly reputable professionals. Um, I think it was great to have lots of information about all the elements to this, but the one that remains missing for me is detailed information about parking building occupancy. Um, on page 57 of their report, they talk about the, um, the study that you, you or someone did around the 11,500 on-street parks um, but it mentions the fact that there was a bit of parking building inclo included, but not much more. Do we yet have any information on the occupancy rates of the parking buildings that we do not own? Uh, we've formally requested occupancy data from the private providers. Wilson have been forthcoming with some data, but the Meridian uh, hasn't. Is that, are we likely to get that? The, the Meridian have indicated that they um, are willing to work with us for a wayfinding system and, and we'll need to understand their occupancy data if we are to provide signage um, letting um, traffic know where parks are. But um, to date they've said no to our request because it's commercially sensitive. Is this because of their offshore ownership or are they just being obtuse and obstructive? It's, it's hard to say. All I've told us and staff is that it's commercially sensitive. And am I correct that the management of the Falul Street car park, which used to be in city ownership, and the Meridian Park are all integrated by the same operator and run by the same operator? It's it, both... The, the word t originally... Yes, correct. Yes. It's all, it's all in one. Right. Yep. Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'm not sure a few of the people to answer this, but I'll try and certainly tell me if it's not appropriate. I'm sure the Chief will. Um, I was interested <coughs> to know, in terms of Council's aspirations and, and goals in this particular area, how important is it that we have the whole suite of, of, um, of projects? What, what I thought I read, and I'm just really checking this, uh, in the report was that if you take one of them out, it takes an element that helps deliver. It seems there's an overlap between them. Would, have I got that right? Yeah, correct. Uh, I mean, the whole Shaping Future to Need and Transport program has been designed as an integrated program, and um, I, I can't talk to the level of impact, but they all um, complement each other. And my other question was around uh, page 109, and it's put in here as a disadvantage, um, and it's around the, the, the element of the public transport system, and it's quite possible you can't answer that, but um, the, the question I have, which is around our confidence that there will be improvements such that will feed into um, this, these integrated plans, because there's so much of this to, seems to rely on improvements to the bus system, which is out of our control. Yeah, no, we're, we're pretty confident working with ORC um, and, and that suite of works. Excellent, thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, can I, um, so given there is a lot of concern around the Prince's Street, bus lane, well, and they've noted that their concern is that parks might be lost. Can you assure people that no parks will be lost in that, with putting that bus lane in? Uh, we, we can't give that assurance now. There's still a lot of work to do to determine how, what that looks like. Okay. And if it goes ahead the way it's proposed, how many parks would go then, do you know? Too early to tell. Okay. No, that's fine. 
Um, with the car park in St Andrews Street, I know we've talked about this a lot, but can you say what plans there are for its future? Are you able to say what, because it would be, a lot of people have said, and I personally agree, that it would be a great site for a transport hub. It's near the hospital, near the inner city, and for a park and ride area, you know, where people could pull up in a car park and building. Park, electric bikes could be left there because they're very expensive, it's a safe place. Any idea of what, if, if that is a possibility in the next 10 years? The possibilities of the next 10 years will be decided by this body over the next, over this week, Councillor. Yes, that's right. However, this is shaping Dunedin's transport. Is there any ambitions in that area? So, so there's nothing in the shaping future Dunedin transport plan to turn St Andrew Street into a hub. Okay. Do you have concerns about <coughs> um, capacity for park and ride to be near the city and for accommodating shift workers at the hospital and, um, you know, just general getting around for our next, for the future of our transport? Do you have concerns about that at the moment, the way things are? If we don't have a transport hub at somewhere like St Andrew Street? Um, I have concerns with the hospital rebuild that there'll be an impact on the transport network. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm a data-driven person. Um, what? Uh, um, I don't have enough data, particularly around parking, to answer that question. Okay. The um, since you mentioned the hospital, uh, uh, have we got any updates on um, what is the latest on the one way? Do we know? Um, so, um, the Shaping Dunedin Future Transport Partners have um, looking at the one-way, two-way two option again in 2024. All right, so that's been put out by quite a bit then, hasn't it? That's, okay, so that would only be looked at then, so then it would take another year or two to actually implement anything, would it? Correct. Okay, thank you. Sorry, can you, um, can, just picking up on that, can you, who made that decision? We said the Connecting Dunedin Partners have decided to not look at it until 2024. That is currently the, yeah, the Shaping Dunedin Future Transport Partners have said that they're not going to look at it until 2024. But who is that? Who made that no, decision? No, sorry, I think, um, so the programme business case is almost <coughs> complete but not quite complete. Um, that's our current understanding of NZTA's position but that hasn't been back through the Connecting Dunedin Partnership. Okay, that's helpful clarification, thank you. Sorry, so Councillor, you carry on. Does that mean that's not not correct, 2024, or is it correct? Uh, our understanding, that's NZTA's position and where they are positioning their funding. Oh, I see. That. Right, thank but, you. But it, but it, has, it hasn't gone through the Connecting to the Partnership. Okay. Could I ask a question around the Harbour Arterial? Um, will that interconnect with the one-way or two-way system on that one-way? Yeah, so the Harbour Arterial comes over the Ward Street overbridge and then yeah. down Frederick Street and then joins on to the State Highway. Right, so if in that proposal, does it, are we looking at, so it depends on what they decide in 2024 as to how that Harbour Arterial will into, you know, intertwine, how the traffic will come in onto that either one way or whether they're going to do it two way or whatever they're going to do, is that the case? That would be correct if there were changes to the state highway. Yes, yes, because there might not be any changes. Yep, okay, thank you very much. Um, central cycle and pedestrian improvements. Can you just expand on that? That's the um, pedestrianising St Andrew Street, is it? And some of the other, there's more cycle lanes or what? Not pedestrianising, just creating a buffered cycle lane along St Andrew oh, and, uh, and Albany Street. And that will be 10 kilometres, will it? No, no. not necessarily, no. I, I, I know, so normal speed? Um, so that would be looked at during the detailed design. Um, it's possible it could be 30, but right. 30, 40, 50. Yeah. Is there a plan to put a um, sort of like a, a roof or a shelter over that area? Because that'll be between the two hospitals, wouldn't it? 
the two hospital buildings, the St Andrew bit, that block. The, the, the last iteration of the design work of the hospital includes sky bridges that connect the Yes, two that's buildings. what I wanted to so say there would be. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Vanders. Regarding um, uh, the uh, data-driven uh, idea that we can um, make better use of existing parking, have you looked at providing Google with information um, that you have currently available and more information that you might have with a view to anyone that Googles parking in Dunedin? with a view to having that as a platform to give people an idea of where parking uh, might be found. I think that's definitely something we could look at, yes. Okay, and if we were to do that uh, as an interim um, and found that it was fairly successful, would we then um, perhaps be able to save ourselves the rather extreme cost of setting up an app and all sorts of other business and simply do some data collection and leave it to the very popular Google platform to actually disseminate that? I think we'd probably establish that through the program business case phase of the parking management roadmap. Okay. Great, thank you. Councillor Reddick. Um, just a couple of little questions. Firstly, about the Princess Street bus priority and corridor. Um, how much time is estimated to be saved by the buses that now use Princess Street between, say, the Kensington and Moray Place? Um, I can't tell you that, Councillor, but I can find out. Right, so we have no estimate of the time saved. But is this the, the principal focus of this project <coughs> is to save time? Is that right? right. Uh, no, that's more to keep buses on schedule at peak times. Right. By how much do they differ from schedule now? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. So we, we have no data on that? Oh, we have the, the data. Just Janine and I don't know it off the top of our head. Okay. Right. Um, what will happen to car parking along Princess Street if this bus lane is instituted? Um, it's too early to tell, um, so we've got to go through a detailed design phase. With any detailed design, there is engagement with stakeholders, so there'll be, um, if there is a loss of car parks, and I can't say if there will be or not, um, it'll go through the normal consultation process. The diagram we see on page 119 shows the bus lane going all the way to Moray Place. So that would be a lane separate to that for car traffic, is that right? Uh, well, there'll be a lane for vehicles, correct. Um, if there's a separate lane for buses, that's not determined. There's, um, the team are more thinking about clearways at intersections rather than a lane the entire length of Princess Street. Right, so how would a, what would a clearway at an intersection look like in two or three examples? Obviously, Mint Street is possibly straightforward, but what about at the bottom of the exchange there, Rattray Street? Yeah, so a, a clearway on the inside of the traffic so the bus can... Um, get priority at the intersection right. and, and, and not queue behind um, multiple cars. So would that mean, for instance, at Rattray Street there'd be no cars allowed in the lane uh, that normally turns to left into Rattray Street if you're heading north towards the Octagon? Not, not necessarily. It's too early to tell. I'm, I'm not a traffic engineer, so it'll go through a process. So would there be a similar uh, clearway at Dowling Street? Councillor, Council, we're not designing the system today, no. and, and there have been a number of very detailed design questions of staff, and the answer's been consistent, that 
that will be worked through as part of detailed design. So I would ask okay. the questions be elevated to a slightly higher level if possible. Okay. Well, looking at um, George Street, uh, the Central Cycleway and Pedestrian Safety is a, a slow speed zone, page 122, map G, diagram G, along George Street. Uh, what is expected to happen then for car parking along George Street? Which shows it, uh, well, a fair way along George Street there. Uh, again, a level of design that we can't answer at this meeting. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Wisha. I just want to ask a couple of questions, just clarifying some costs. The document that went out to consultation says that the central city parking management is $11 million, but in this report it says $9.5 million, and then the central city cycle and pedestrian improvements has in the document that went out for consultation $5 million, and then in this document it says $6.6 .6 million. So I'm just wondering how the costs have changed in between that document and that document. Yeah, there's a um, the team have been reconciling the numbers of some errors made earlier in the piece that went into the consultation document that have now been rectified in this paper. Thank you. My second question is around some of the costs and in the consultation document it says our share is 50% that Waka Kotahi would um, pay, pay the other 50%. Is that still relevant? It is, councillor, yes. Okay, that, that's, I can't see it in, in this paper, but we would make the <coughs> assumption that on those one, two, three, four, five projects that we just pay 50%. Sorry, the only one, um, the parking management doesn't attract such a high funding assistant, assistance rate. So that'll be 50-50 on, on the assistance rate? At a, at, no, it... The four, uh, the four projects apart from the parking management will be 50-50, um, but I'd need to check the far rate for the parking management because it'll be a lot lower. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lofiso. Tēnā koe, Your Worship. Tēnā korua, Ms Benson, rā wako, Mr Drew. Um, I was um, reading in, in the area of page 136, which was the Cagney report, so thank you so much for such a hiring these people because it's such a comprehensive and um, well detailed um, explanation and I was surprised to read that D DCC is subsidising long stay commuter parking and priority should be given to short term customers and, and basically saying I think we need to develop a parking management policy and my understanding is that that work developing the policy has been done um, I, and I understand that the transport team is really small, so is the policy on its way or...? So the policy will be started subject to today's decision, I guess, so we... Just on that, because I think the discussion in, in the Cagney report around how we manage basically prioritisation and pricing fundamentally uh, is, is um, part of the transport network is quite critical to the, to the work uh, and so it's great to know that it will start predicated on the decisions that are made today but when would you anticipate that work being done so that we would then have council positions on things like prioritisation, pricing has to be done through budget meetings, I appreciate that, but policy decisions don't necessarily need to wait for that cycle. Yeah, correct. Um, so if the, the Wellington policy took two years from start till finish. We, we don't think it needs to take us that long. Um, we think it'll take at least a year if we're going to do really good engagement with the community uh, and give them multiple opportunities to comment into the policy. Um, so uh, our current thinking is about a year. That wouldn't be done in time to inform our fees and charges for the next annual plan round? P potentially. So the current thinking is 
uh, subject to council decision, do the wayfinding system and do the policy in parallel, and then the policy will then inform the next tranche of work. That's helpful clarification. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. It's a timely question, Your Worship, and Councillor Fiso, because there's been a lot of talk about, in the feedback and, and in the media as well, about the need for car parking as the hospital gets built. And is it correct that the feedback that has come from this council has been that at the moment we are neutral on that, that we've neither rejected nor accepted the need because what we're trying to do is work out the current use of parking and other such things and that we want to get through this body of work and then we'll be in a position to have a better understanding? Is that more or less where we are with that? That would be correct. So, so we don't have a position yet of either reject or accept? Correct. Thanks. And I just want to have a question around um, bus lanes and priority lanes and clearways. Um, are they always permanent or can they also be time-based so you can decide when you've got a constrained section of road that you would say during the rush hour that would be a clear way for buses and then later on in the day it would come back to parking? Yes, you can do that. And they do run those systems in cities like Auckland and Christchurch, correct? Yep. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you. Um, I have a number of questions, and on page 117, um, it says longer term consolidate existing off street car parking, which um, all these um, all these mechanisms will do um, to some degree, and explore potential new parking areas, e.g., adjacent to arterial routes near the hospital, and so. Um, what work's been done in that area at the moment? And at the end of that, it's consolidate off-street parking strikes, sites, upgrade and improve pedestrian access routes and contribute to potential new parking areas, particularly related to the hospital. I, th I think, Councillor, that would be part of this piece of work. I can elaborate a little bit um, there. Um, um, some sites around the city um, where you could change parallel parking to angle parking um, and so staff have identified those sites and we know where we could but um, when you facilitate more car parks you facilitate more pedestrian movements and, and lots of those sites um, don't have good walking access out of them and back into the city, good safe walking access. So if we were to facilitate more car parks um, we would um, want to upgrade pedestrian routes. So does, like, does off-street parking actually enable more pedestrian and cycling? Like, if, if people are, say for the hospital, for example, which people are really concerned about, um, enable um, a win-win for that area? That's what I'm trying to think about. Because if we don't create off-street parking, what will happen is all the, what could happen, and I'm just putting it out there, is people who want to go to hospital will use up all the retail parking spaces and there will be less parking spaces. But if we can take them off the street, could that enable more parking and cycling like St Andrews Street, etc., and make the area safer? But potentially, I guess that's the um, the recommendation to do a parking management policy is for council to decide what the priorities for parking are, and so is that all day parking or is it commuter uh, sorry commuter parking or or shopper parking, and and I, I guess that policy would set the priorities and hierarchies for how parking is managed in the city to contribute to the outcomes that you're talking about? Um, it's just, uh, uh, it's okay. No, it's, those are the, um, the, the other question was actually just around the harbour art arterial route. Now, um, in the harbour arterial route, there's an, a number of um, quite big changes. Um, and I, my question around that is actually when it comes to 
something that we're looking at parallel is the waterfront bridge. And that high volume of traffic and the number of different access paths into that area create actually quite a complex issue related to cycling and walking and getting across that area. Would that Im impact the um, staging of the waterfront bridge, you know, and time-wise? Because um, for cyclists and, and pedestrians, it's actually quite a dangerous area. So I think the harbour arterial is um, envisaged a lot earlier than the waterfront bridge, councillor. Thank you. Um, just because the spectre of the hospital parking capacity or adjacent parking capacity has been raised, there's some discussion in the Cagney report about the discrepancy between what we charge for leased parking and what the market provides that service for. Um, does that discrepancy make it more or less likely that the commercial provision of, of parking capacity in and around the hospital development, does that make it more or less likely? It would be less likely for the private sector to invest because um, it impacts on their commercial returns. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Barry. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, starting off on um, page 149, uh, page 20 of the Cagney report, uh, it talks about the interviews um, in 1.6. Can you advise me... Um, who was who was involved in um, this process? Because it just says several internal Dunedin City Council staff and external count, uh, stakeholders. You know, were councillors involved? You know, who was engaged? So um, internally within DCC, most uh, well, all of the departments. You know, property enforcement um, were engaged around this. And then externally, uh, we had a workshop of about eight or nine participants with people like the Southern DHB, um, NZTA, um, and various other stakeholders, Dine the new Dunedin Hospital as well. Uh, any councillors? Um... Okay. Um, well, yeah, that's what I was hoping there would have been a list in the report to say who was engaged with, so hence the question. Uh, no, they aren't, but it does say did any council staff and other external stakeholders, so I, I was just following that through. Um, in the report on page 27, it talks about a series of councils that, where obviously Cagney has done a lot of, quite a bit of work, and you know, it's a, quite a good paper that they presented to us, but do any of the um, cities that they reference actually have hospitals in the CBDs? Because I couldn't find one that does. The, yeah, there's some that are not far away, but um, when I went through, for example, New Plymouth, is referenced here as examples of city councils with specific parking policies. And then when I went through it, I'm going through all the cities, Hamilton, the hospital's quite a way out, so I'm trying to cross-reference some of the information. But I can't recall any other city in New Zealand that has a hospital in the CBD like we do. We can find out that information, Council. OK, thank you. Um, Following up, the provision of parking on sorry on page um, 35 of the report 164 of our papers, um, the provision of parking for the new hospital is being planned and discussed between the various stakeholders involved to ensure a, a balance between the access needs of the hospital and the transport outcomes of Dunedin. Is anybody able to um, inform me of where that discussion is about uh, a hospital car park? No, I think that's discussed at the lag, is it? It's a question no. for the for the well, either the DHB or for the New Dunedin Hospital Group. Okay. Um, we then go through uh, the hospital's gonna come through the DCC team for consenting, or is that gonna be that's gonna be done as a local No, Council supported uh, 
the New Dunedin Hospital project being sent to the Minister through for direct consent consideration. Okay. And when I look back on previous developments, for example, the Stinction Hotel, there was a requirement for car parking put through on that. Has that... As, 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 as all RM commissioners would understand at this point, the MPS for Urban Development no longer requires or doesn't allow us to require parking provision as part of any development. Okay, thank you. Um, back to the DCC and the um, car parks. What is the wait list for the current Dunedin City Council car park spots? Um, sorry, Councillor, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can find that out reasonably quickly. Okay. Are we still accepting people onto that list? Uh, my understanding is we still are, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, when I look at the data for March 2018, so March 2020, that was um, the Cagney referenced around where they had took some data on car parking and traffic flows. Um, was the um, spaces or any consideration taken into place around the loss of car parks? For example, after that effect, the old MSD site uh, on the corner of Cumberland and St Andrews came down. That was a loss of 258 car parks. We then have a, uh, the loss of uh, the car park on the Hanover and Cumberland, which is another 90 car parks. So was that considered in this paper about additional loss of car parks? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, there was an occupancy survey done in March 2020. That was for on-street okay. car parking only. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any provisions, um, and again, I saw touching on this, around um, electric vehicles and greater uh, parking for electric vehicles in a purpose-built space? Yes, there's a piece of work uh, ongoing at the moment that's looking at electrical vehicle charging infrastructure needs holistically for the city. That, that, that work hasn't been concluded or brought to council. Okay. Um, and my final question at this time is around the um, city policy on signage. Um, obviously, there's going to be multiple signs erected to direct people where to park and everything else. Does that sort of flow into our second generation plan around traffic flow and si about signage on uh, our road system and also in regards to Waka Katahi and their signage policy on the state highway? Yeah, the project will need to comply with all the relevant regulations. Is it easy to how, how difficult is it to get a breakdown of in our off street parking facilities? How much of that capacity is made available to leased parking versus casual parking? Yeah, we have that data. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but we yeah, have that's it. Yeah, it just would be um, it'd be interesting background. Councillor Lord. Um, yeah, look, my question was in the report in the Cagney report. There was talk about um, numbers of recidivist parking offenders and it said about 284 people that had received um, more than five tickets, uh, more than three tickets or more than five tickets in the previous, th yeah more than five tickets in the previous three months. Now their conclusion was that there was not a big enough penalty. Now my question is do we know if those people actually pay their tickets? Um, I mean probably isn't a big enough penalty if you're going to pay four dollars an hour and you get a twelve dollar fine it's probably not a big deal if you game it but I'm just wondering if those people pay their fines or not. We, we can find that out. Thank yep. you. Yep. Never thought about whether parking fines were tax deductible for business purposes until now. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Worship. Just a clarification question, really. So if we decide to include these projects um, in our long-term plan, does that mean the project will go ahead regardless, or does it mean that that then enables the work to proceed in developing a, a clearer idea of what it will be, and then it will come back to Council for a final approval? So any any project that um, attracts Waka Kotahi funding has to go through a, proce a business case process, um, and clearly you'd have to get a benefit-cost ratio that was positive. 
So that, that, that would be the first um, piece of work that we would start on for these suite of projects. So assuming we do get a, a successful benefit cost ratio, does the project then automatically proceed or does it come back through council for a final sign-off? It would be our intention to report through the relevant committee. I guess that would be uh, infrastructure committee. You can, you, can, you can fight over it later. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you. Uh, along the same lines, I'm looking at um, the recommendations in the Cagney report on page 137 of their report, Appendix B, page 8 of that appendix. Um, and clearly there's an overlap between what we have got in terms of the recommendations about the six projects that were consulted on. Um, for example, the first one talks about the wayfinding issue. Um, and I'm just foreshadowing that um, sorry, I'm not clear how you're planning to proceed and you've just illuminated us as to some of that. Um, so I'm foreshadowing a motion that, that Rebecca has that will enable us to develop a work plan to follow those and progress those recommendations that aren't picked up as part of the six that doesn't present you with any difficulties procedurally? It doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> Thank you. I know it, it follows from what Councillor Staines was talking about and what the Mayor was alluding to before. I just, I think the, I'll, I'll, say, what, I'll say what I think about it when we talk to the motion. Very kind of you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, would you say you're happy with the viable options, alternative options, from using a car that we've got in our city currently? Because we're talking about shaping the transport, you know, for our future. Have, what sort of viable options have we got? We've got buses, and I mean, there's a lot of things we're not happy with the buses. We had talked about a loop bus, but we haven't confirmed that yet. We've talked about park and ride, but that's not confirmed yet. But I mean, you know, we're asking people to make major changes to the way they drive around our city. And I realise for a thriving city, we need to accommodate, and I think it's a good thing, accommodate for cyclists, accommodate for pedestrians, but also car users Councillor, are a large part of that. Councillor, uh, the, the, the question, your question seemed to be, what are the viable alternatives? My view would be that viability is a matter of perspective, but is, is that the question? My question is around, yes, what viable alternatives have we got except for, with the exception of the bus, that we're not happy with the buses, so what, you know, what other, because we haven't got a, you know, train unfortunately, but I mean I'm just trying to work out what alternatives, because the whole point is we've got to reduce the number of cars, and yet... Councillor, you need, you need to stop asking the question to allow for it to be answered. Yes, well I was trying to be, interrupted me. Yeah, the, the question's quite short. What are the viable alternatives? If, if, if that's the question you want to right. put to staff, let them answer it. Thank you for that. I'll consult you to write my speeches in the future. Right. Uh, so there are obviously walking and cycling, um, but just note in the report that we are working alongside ORC as part of the Shaping Dunedin Future Transport on bus, um, on, on bus patronage. Right. Do, do you feel that at the moment... Um, we've done enough initiatives to get people out of their cars. Public servants don't have feelings, no, Councillor, but... That's a difficult <laughs> question to answer. Yeah. OK. Um, I mean, would you say that we are, uh, from a holistic point of view, that we have, because we're aiming to try and have a thriving city where, holistically, we have cars and, you know, cyclists and pedestrians all going along together, is will this make it easier for people in a car to get around, these changes? The purpose behind the Shaping Future and then Transport programme of work is to create a more integrated system. Um, I guess the investment um, in the transport network over the last couple of decades has predominantly been um, around the motor vehicle. Uh, this is not about removing cars, this is about providing more equitable access to other modes of transport. If we look at removing cars, Dowling Street's going, the car park building there. 
We've got that with the hospital, the, there was a car park there that I believe is gone through the demolition of the buildings. Is that correct? Uh, correct, Darling yes. Street's. Oh, Darling Street's gone, but the one around the hospital, there's one, I think, a car park, I think that's gone correct. too, hasn't yep. it, the hospital? And we're not sure whether the hospital, it's not our fault, but we're not sure whether the hospital was going to put in car parking there. Is that fair to say? Correct. Right. Is that putting pressure on our, uh, on on the number, on the cars, uh, uh, you know, on, on the way people get around our city and find a park? Uh, again, I refer to my earlier answer on data driven, uh, evidence based decisions, and, um, and I think what's highlighted in this report as well is we don't have sufficient evidence and we don't have uh, a policy to um, provide a hierarchy of who's prioritised for car parking and who isn't. But there's only, a there's only a limited amount of space on the road that we manage. Yep. But we have cut back on some car parks in the streets as well, to add to that, haven't we? Uh, well, the, uh, the, in this report it says that in the CBD there's a couple of hundred parks that have been added. Right. Um, in, in my time at Council, the parks that have been removed are in the residential suburbs uh, to facilitate safer <laughs> buffs movement, so having tapers into and out of. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to justify our nine point something million for signage to find a park. Well, the justifi the a justification is for elected members to make, not at this point, not for staff. Last time I knew I was an elected member, um, to to find out where a park is. Councillor, well, it's, it's, it's not a fair question to our staff to justify, but the, the, the justification is for us to make in, in debating the resolution when we get to that point. But I'm just asking. Can I also a raise a point of order that I've already clarified it is not just signage. I've already clarified that that's not what the 9.5 million is for in earlier questions. Well, the 3.5 yeah, uh, then. Councillor, I won't uphold the the point of order, but I, I, I would suggest to councillors that this may be a more efficient process if we all collectively listen to the responses to the questions that have been asked. Yes. Right. Um, so. Can I just clarify the question that was answered to Councillor O'Malley's question around the hospital car parking? I didn't quite understand, and I was a bit shocked by. Um, was the answer? Can you just clarify that answer there? Because it sounded like, and I just want to correct, find out if I'm correct in what I heard, that the council has not given in, has not asked the hospital to put p car parking in. Is that what you were saying there? No, the, the MPSUD oh. doesn't allow, through the consenting process, doesn't allow the whoever, and it won't be us uh, hearing the consent, but it doesn't allow right. the consenting authority, whoever it is, to require parking provision as part of a development. So that's, right. no, lo that's no longer an option. We can't write it into district plans. You can't do that. It was a, it's a higher level policy audit set by um, government. Because there's a lot, of course, there's a lot of people who come from outside. Do you have a question for staff? Of them, the, I've got a point how, of order. Do, how do we point deal with the people that come point from Point of order, Councillor Benson Pug. It's also a matter of public record, um, Your Worship, that the hospital has made an announcement about parking on the Bow Street site as part of the services building. And Pete Hodgson, the, now the SDHB chair, uh, was unequivocal in the media on the front page of the ODT about the provision of parking being part of the hospital build. Councillors might like to acquaint themselves with the fact. Again, not a point of order, but a useful clarification. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not going to uphold the point of order. I'm sorry, I thought it was implicit. But Do you have further questions of staff at this point? Well, Councillor? I give up every time I try and ask you. Until Councillor Reddick. Um, thank you. Um, the, what will be the effect of the harbour arterial development on parking along Ward Street and other parts on that side of the railway line? Uh, we'd have to go through that um, in the detailed design of the harbour arterial for me to be able to answer that. Okay. Have there been, there's comments in the Cagney report about uh, parking on residential streets and since we've lost so many car parks from out of the city centre, 
have there been an increase in complaints from residents in the outer lying or I suppose edge of the CBD suburbs? Uh, the, in the time that I've been here, I have seen that increase, yes. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. And um, in terms of the parking management initiative that we have on our papers, uh, it was my reading of the various data that there is no NZTA Wakakatahi funding for that. That's correct, yeah. Thank you. And in our examine, in our view, or in our uh, review of, I suppose it's ongoing, of parking in the city, has there been any work done on the provision of EV parks catering for bring your own cable uh, facilities? So where people that have got, for instance, a leaf or something can bring a cable and just plug in, plug into an ordinary three pin plug, because we do have some provision for fast charges. Now there are some, several fast charges around, but are a pay as you go. But obviously the current demand well, the, the quantum of electricity demand for a, uh, a typical three-pin plug and, and a bring-your-own-cable situation is much less, but it's very, very much suitable for commuter parking where people can leave their car all day. Uh, yeah, correct. There's a piece of ongoing work looking at EV charging holistically across the whole city. Right. And so do you think that um, provision of bring-your-own-cable parking for EVs would encourage, I suppose this sort of possibly a request for an opinion, do you think it would encourage the use of EVs in the city? Would it, alternatively, would that extend the range for which people with uh, appropriate EVs could then come to Dunedin? I presume so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not an EV owner. My limited understanding is uh, fast charge for um, long distance commuting because people are trying to go somewhere and commuters tend to charge at their own residences uh, overnight. Yes. So if they could simil uh, similarly charge all day at a car park facility in town. Um, As per I, the earlier responses of staff council, yes. we've, we've reached a degree of detail that they aren't able to answer at this point. Well, it does speak to the next part that uh, if that sort of, so the first question was, or the prior question was whether that had been considered, so that's under consideration. Correct. And and if there was more EV use, that would be that would fit into uh, <clears throat> our carbon zero strategy and reduce, you know, increase the number of EVs and uh, reduce the number of combustion engine vehicles. However, they would need, uh, my expectation is that those I also have an expectation, Councillor Atten, is that you're going to ask a question. Yes. My expectation is that those car parks with an EV, a three-pin plug provided, would need to be as part of a building. Does that seem fair? Again, you're asking very specific detailed questions mm. that staff have said they are not qualified to answer at this point. Okay. Do you have any higher level strategic type questions to ask? Well, um, did you notice in the Kegney report uh, on page 170 that it may require an, it consolidate parking in more strategically located hubs? This may require investment in multi-level car parking. Yes, I saw that in the Kegney report. Thank you. We all get to find something, don't we? Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, you were talking before about the um, off-street parking down in the industrial area and the kind of perverse outcome in a way of the difficulty of pedestrians getting into the city um, and not easy access. Would that be one of the... I, I read in the Cagney report on page 154, um, it said an overabundance of parking can have negative outcomes. Would that be the kind of negative outcome that that refers to? Yeah, correct. That's one of the negative outcomes here. So it in, in, introduces more potential for mode conflict, pedestrians and cars. And um, 
similar to the question I asked earlier about the projects and the importance, the interrelationship between them, um, when we start to get into parking matters, and there are several projects around parking matters, is it also true that um, initiatives around that are interrelated? You can't just pick one thing out uh, and say this is the, the key to it all, just as you can't pick loss of some car parking out and say that's the problem, we need to supply more. Is that is that correct? Am I interpreting that correctly, that, that it's an interrelated? That's correct, they are interrelated. And will one of the things we consider when we go on to establish a policy, depending on today's decisions around the... Um, uh, well, the Cagney report refers to this, the prioritising of those with greatest need would be one of the kinds of things that we would consider as a council? Yes, that would be correct. Um, in any of the projects that we're planning, um, is consideration being given to, and are there any aspects of any of them where if people don't own a smartphone and... Um, and can't access that kind of technology, uh, are we continuing to think about those folk so that people are not excluded from any of the initiatives? Yes, we would definitely be thinking of all, all users Brilliant. as we develop this. Uh, I was surprised by the high percentage of households who don't own a car, and I'm assuming that's also another consideration as we, as we look at the projects? Yes, yep. And my final question was around the figures. I was I noted in the Cagney report, and thank you for that. Um, it, it's great to have um, evidence that we can base decisions on going forward. Um, the the figures used were 2018. What would be the key changes that you would consider important? And maybe that's for another time, or perhaps it's you know on the spot too much to ask but I, I was thinking of things like you know increased car ownership what would be some of the key things that might have changed since 2018 in terms of the figures um, I think the introduction of flat fares in, um, in buses and public transport um, would have changed and there have been some routing changes in public transport that have um, that have um, change some um, patterns as well. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Just want to raise a concern around use of smartphones in cars. We see that I was going to ask the question, do we know the percentage of people that um, drive a single person in a car? Uh, yes, we do have surveys that look at that. I, I don't know off the top of my head, though. Because it, I, I'm just raising that because it's illegal to use a smartphone in a car, any phone, um, and we know of people that have died in, in car accidents because of the use of phones, and I'm just concerned about the, the thinking about relying on an app to show people where parking is. I just kind of want to put that out there. Um, I'm not quite sure what the answer is. Do other cities use um, phone apps for parking? Are you talking about looking at live occupancy data? I'm just imagining if I was driving down the road down George Street and I'm looking for a park and I'm getting on my phone, <laughs> where do I stop, how do I look at my phone, etc. The actual practicalities of putting something on an app. Uh, yes, yeah, so that, that's not the current intent of the app. The app is to pay for the parking. The way finding signage is to direct people to the parks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just looking at, um, first of all, the question around um, something Chris Chris said, um, was it around the process and there will be business cases and proposals, etc. But um, you also mentioned something about engagement. So, um, say for example, the Princess Street business case, um, will you be going to all the businesses along there, talking to them and having that engagement in the whole process? Because that's a real, yeah, yeah, that's a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, as part of um, 
been co-funded by Waka Kotahi, um, there is quite a process for engagement with people um, through that business case process. So everybody will be consulted. A lot. Uh, who are the, well, the stakeholders basically. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now, um, one of the other things is I did a study of, and, and there's some really good stuff on where people come from, um, and it's around 37,700 who come from the south. Um, into town and out of town um, and I note the tunnels trail is in the sort of plan but um, when it comes to electric bikes and cycling and enabling um, another way of reducing cars is it, this isn't in this proposal but do you see it as part of the solution particularly as electric bikes are just having a huge uptake now uh, it, it is partly in the submission in the fact that linking up um, the tunnels trail with the central city and the cycle lane proposed along Princess Street creates a, a complete network from Mosgill all the way to the city centre. Because um, if you, um, one of the things I want to press is that 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 is. Um, do, you, do you know how much time an electric bike would take to get from a home in Mosgill to their workplace? Probably depends how fast you're riding it, Councillor. Ah, uh, well, electric bikes go quite fast. And I did the calculation, it's about 30 oh, so minutes. It's, so it's not a question. Do you have any further questions? <laughs> well, I just had to get that point too, right? Um, There's plenty of, we have substantial and, time for debate, Councillor. And um, the other thing is, um, one of the, the concerns, and it's a real concern, is that a lot of um, people have problems with accessing um, George Street anywhere, or the hospital, because they've got mobility issues. And the assurance that there's mo mobility parking to enable people to access services is really, really important. And it's just and other people you... seem to have an issue being able to determine what is a question and what isn't. Counselor. No, no, I'm just it's going to no, al no. Allocating resources on the basis of highest need has yes. already been discussed yes, by way of I'm response just to questions. I'm Do you have any new questions? Ask, I'm just going to ask: um, Has um, is there adequate provision for m mobility parking in this? I can say, Councillor, that we would be looking at the um, provision of um, mobility parking in the, in, as part of this work, yes. Councillor Reddick. Um, yes, just a uh, complete opposite. Instead of a detailed question, we have heard a lot about you know, these six provisions. It's a bit rich, though, the, isn't it? Sorry? Carry on. The, these six initiatives, how uh, they're part of an overall strategy, could you paint that overall master plan for us, please? Could you paint a picture of that overall master plan? What's it all about and how's it all going to work for us? Um, I guess to sum it up, without boring everyone, uh, integrated transport network. Um, I kind of touched on it earlier. A uh, couple of decades of investment predominantly in the motor vehicle. Um, some of this investment is still for the motor vehicle and some of it is for pedestrian and cycling and public transport. So it's um, trying to um, improve access to some other modes of transport other than the private motor vehicle. Does that answer your question? Councillor Walker. Um, yeah, I've got a, a, a brief question. Just uh, Councillor Houlihan has gone quiet. I'm going to try and ask a question that will help tease out an answer you were probably trying to get around uh, perceived parking pressure and, and congestion. Um, the question is, if we were to follow the guidelines as set down in our integrated transport strategy and invest better in public transport, port cycling and other sustainable uh, transport modes, is it not the case that the outcome would be two sets of broad sets of beneficiaries. One, better provision for those who want those alternatives, but more importantly, better outcomes for those people who actually need to drive. Correct. I'll take Councillor O'Malley, uh, and then I'm probably going to adjourn for lunch.
Very good. Um, this is in the report, but I just want to bring attention to it. Page 139, we look at the Dunedin population change, and you look from 2013 on, you can see that it gets steeper. And in that eight, 2013 to the 2020, so seven or eight years, the city's population has grown by 10,000 people. And it says in the paragraph above that a lot of that growth has been to the south. Is that agreed? So would that then be able, that would be putting strain on the traffic network system, I imagine, would it not? That's correct, yes. Thank you, Your Worship. Hopefully this will be a short one. I'm just looking at the ongoing costs of the um, pay-by rates each year, and I've added them up to 2.9 million per year. Are those ongoing costs that went out to consultation, are they, have they changed any since they went out to consultation, given that some of the other um, the capital costs have changed? Maybe I can answer that, Councillor. So the, the two projects that had the change w w was effectively offsetting each other. So the total amount of the, of the spend of $51 odd million hasn't changed. So therefore, the, the operating costs will be of a similar nature to what was consulted on. So can I just understand the operating costs? Because it's adding an extra $3 million a year to the rates bill, and it talks about um, generally, I guess, a few of them are roads. So <laughs> this is a really stupid... The roads are already there. How come we have to pay another nearly a million dollars a year for the harbour arterial improvements? Once they're in, why are we paying that much a year? It would be the cost of, obviously, the, the funding of the debt, our, oh. our share of the debt, and also, the, obviously, the ongoing maintenance of that new facility. OK, that's great clarification. Thank you. Because, because there is a, there's a direct correlation, isn't there, between the, the weight of traffic you put on a road and the cost of maintaining that asset. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm going to move that we adjourn for lunch. Second of Councillor Walker, uh, coming back at 10 to 1. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed.
Yes, yes, I might as well wait for Mike as well. <laughs> and then we can start when he gets here. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's been moved by Councillor O'Malley. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconded Councillor Lofiso. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Just a question. Can these be taken in parts? Oh, the vote will absolutely be taken in parts, yes. Okay. But they will, they will be d debated. I'm just, I'm just trying to clarify That's fine. that. Always happy to. Councillor Wiley. Do we have ability to ask any more questions? Well, what have, what have your ruminations over the lunch break uh, uh, brought to the surface, Councillor? Well, actually, it's followed up on uh, Councillor Benson Pope's comment about um, the articulation uh, last year of that there will be car parking with the new hospital. Well, it's not really a question for staff, then, is it? No, I'm quite happy to direct it at the. Well, you can you can deal with it. The you, you can deal with it. No, no, no. You can deal with it and speaking to the resolution if you think it's pertinent to this yep. discussion. It's been moved and seconded. Councillor O'Malley, would you like to speak to us? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this, in my opinion, is a complete package, although we will take them in separate parts. Um, and it can almost be broken into three sections. The harbour arterial efficiency improvement is about the movement of vehicles through the city. It's, a, um, it's an activity that is designed to get heavy traffic out of the centre of the city and based on really the willingness to spend extra money to either do a grade separation by burying it or build a massive western bypass, it is actually the only alternative we really have to heavy traffic. Um, Centre City Parking Management, again, is more of a traffic movement one, but the Princess Street Bus Priority Corridor and the Park and Ride facilities in Mosgill and Burnside are interlinked. Um, for people to move to public transport, it will have to be both cost effective and competitive in time and the bus priority lanes are required there to achieve that. Um, the cycle and pedestrian improvements and the centre city bike hubs relate to um, mode shift and um, mode neutrality. The city is growing and the question I asked at the very end, the population change from 2013 to 2020 with 10,000 people coming into the city in just seven years. That is the first time we've seen it. And that is leading to changes in the ability of our transport network to deal with the load. Not only is the city increasing at that rate, but the car ownership is increasing at a higher rate. And so we're running into a point now where the traffic system, as it operates in the current form, is getting very, very, very close to starting to fail. And we're starting to see that, that failure appear at certain times of the day. We now have a very small rush hour, which ironically is kind of poo-pooed by other cities, but it is going to get much worse if we don't do anything about it. There may be some frustration with the um, granularity of the projects as we plan to fund them, but that relates to the fact that we have to get funding in in this 10-year round, and it's coming slightly ahead of the planning timing. So we have to have faith in the staff that as these get fleshed out into greater detail, we will be satisfied with the outcomes. Um, there has been a fair amount of talk, in fact, it seems to dominate whenever these packages come up around the parking capacity in the city and our desire to build more parking capacity or not. The reason I asked the question about whether or not the council had a position on the hospital car park was to make it clear that we have not rejected it, but we are basically trying to go forward with these current activities to see what they do before we commit to the next to the next step. So we need to have an opportunity for them to, to be done and then to play out and then see what they do for us. Um, so remember that this body of work is not the final say 
on our transport network. It is the it is the next near-term set of pro um, activities that we want to work with, and they reflect the fact that the city is getting bigger and busier, and we also have a district plan and a spatial plan that, that, that harmonises us towards a compact city, and that means that if you do that, you've got a very limited road reserve space to occupy in, and you're trying to get lots of activities in a very confined space, and that's what this is about. It's trying to address all those competing needs. Um, so no doubt that there are more alternative solutions that need to be put forward. And I, I would also argue another thing. We are seeing an intergenerational change towards transport. I know many people under the age of 30 who don't possess a driver's licence. And they are dependent entirely on our ability to supply them with the other modes of transport around the city. And that's what I believe this is, this is about. And in fact, if I was to say anything about these projects, it's not that they have gone too far, it is in fact that we need to accelerate this work and in many respects we may still be sitting behind the eight ball in terms of speed and I'm looking forward to seeing more projects come in behind. But we must accept all of these as they are now so we can make the first really important step we've made for a long time. And that gets back to maybe our ability to deal with planning and, and execution of these programs. Up until recently, because the city was not growing, we also had no aspirations for, um, for planning and, and, and future, future planning. We've got a relatively small team in our transport team, and I think that it's very impressive that what the amount of work they've managed to get through right now, but they are worked very hard. And so I would ask the people of the city to be patient in, in, in the output of these teams because in fact they are trying to get us to a place that we need to get to quickly and I would imagine that in the future we will have to resource this work even more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Vanivis. Shaping future Dunedin transport program I believe is misnamed and misconceived. The very first word, shaping, implies that our transportation department can shape our transport future. Plainly they can't. If you look at the vehicles purchased last year, more than half of them were SUVs or four-wheel drives. People are not going to buses in their droves and they have no intention of doing so. The idea that we can shape the transportation future. Basically, I believe, from my point of view, simply covers over the ideology of two wheels good, four wheels bad. We are going to shape things so that the public of Dunedin will do what we want in the image that we require. After, after the word shaping, complete misnomer, comes future Dunedin. The future Dunedin, as Councillor O'Malley has already said, is an increasing population, some 10,000 uh, people in the next seven years, and yet there is not one extra car park for these extra 10,000 people in the whole of this obscenely expensive $53 million ideological splurge on changing transportation. Not only is there no extra parking, but there is no real way of dealing with the growing congestion that has been brought about by the proliferation of cycle lanes on the one-way street the narrowing of roads, the slowing of transport, the speed bumps, all the other bits of plastic flotsam that get chucked around our roads these days because somebody wants to shape the future of our transportation. People are driving their kids to schools in their SUVs despite all these issues and double and triple parking in some places to do it. So it's sheer hubris, I believe. It's just fantasy that we can shape the future. What we can do, of course, is we can spend $53 million and waste the lot of it. <clears throat> Let me start with the harbour arterial efficiency improvements. 
The plan here is simply to divert the congestion that we have created in the one-way street system and move this congestion to the harbour arterials at a cost of 16-something million, with a million dollars worth of uh, cost resulting every year in the debt that results from it, because it's all debt funded, and in the extra maintenance that's required from shifting the congestion problem from where the hospital is to the harbour arterial. It's hardly what you call a, a, an imaginative or positive use of the money. It's simply a waste. Uh, let's get on to some of the other ones. If we look at the Central City Parking Management Program, I mean, it's another $9.5 million that's going to manage parking. There's manage again, like shaping. This is telling people what they're going to do in their cars. It's not going to work, it never has, it never will. You can try and drive cars, car drivers, into taking the bus, a Victorian motor transport, all you like. But the fact is that buses are a Victorian mode which have been decreasing now and used for 50 years and are going to disappear to nothing as the new electric vehicles come through. And then you go through the park and ride. It's going to be an absolute catastrophe, a waste of $10 million for a couple of car parks which nobody is going to use because if you have to drive to the car park, why would you then wait for a bus and pay for it when your car can zip you into where you want to go and take your shopping home for you. Makes no sense at all. Uh, central cycle and pedestrian improvements is just an addition to the $60 million George Street budget that we already have for turning George Street into a glorified cycleway. I can't see any positives coming out of any of this other than perhaps some roading contractors, and some manufacturers of plastic bollards. $53 million will be most easily saved if we vote against this whole package. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I agree. I will be voting for, um, I wasn't going to vote for any of them, but I will vote for two items on there, and they are the... Um, park and ride facilities in Mosgill and Burnside. Um, however, I have a reservation around that because once people get in the car, statistically, you'll tend to, as Councillor Vandivis rightfully said, it's easier to just carry on and go into town. But if we can encourage people to park and ride, they might be able to park and bike. And I'm thinking particularly around Mosgill is that if we had a great, you know, which we haven't quite yet, but if we had a really good... Um, lane or, or area there that we've been that certainly it's been touted many times and we've you know it'd be great if it could happen uh, that on an electric bike you could whip in if Steve if Councillor Walker can do it from Port Chalmers we could do it from Mosgill is get into town and um, you know on your electric bike however as Councillor Vandivis has raised and he is correct it's not always convenient like if you want to pick up shopping or if you it does mean a different way of doing things a different way of thinking and I know I sound like a broken record because I've seen that, said this numerous times but my feeling is if we want people to come on this journey with us, we have to start changing the messaging. And I don't know whether this comms has to come from ORC or in an ideal world, I think it needs to jointly be put out. But talking about carpooling and the benefits of it, talking about the benefits of walking, talking about the benefits of, of cycling and ways, you know, make it easy for people. People will make decisions if you make it easy for them. And if you keep, if they keep hearing things, they'll start to pick it up. But we haven't been doing that messaging that I've seen, unless I've missed it somewhere, I don't know. But... Uh, you know, we have these goals, and I understand for absolutely right. And I, abs I take my hat off to um, Mr. Drew and um, Ms. Benson because it's not an easy job. I mean, we have, as Councillor O'Malley raised, and it's true, it's not sustainable. We have 
more and more people pouring into our city. We're a popular city, we're a beautiful city, and we've got a lot going for us. And as far as traffic, I mean, many of us here have lived all around the world, as have I as well. And I mean, I spent three years in Auckland, and, you know, I used to go in the car and we'd change, get out of the car, walk around, change seats, and I'd do all my makeup and have my breakfast and have, you know, do everything in the off driver's seat. And, you know, because we're sitting for so long, not even moving, we used to take an hour and a half, I spent three hours a day driving. So we don't know how lucky we are in Dunedin. We don't, thankfully, right now don't have that. And that sounded like Fred Dagg, didn't it? But anyway, but despite us not knowing how lucky we are, we also need to make it easier for people to make these decisions because people are going to do what's easy. And right now, it is easy to get in your car because our other options are not, um, you know, not easy. I've, and I've mentioned this once again numerous times, but I've um, had friends and family who catch a bus. Sometimes my friend only had to catch it because her car had broken down. And for that week when she did that, it was a nightmare. And just, you know, uh, uh, the buses drove past her, the buses were late, she had the kids and um, papers and bags and boxes, nowhere to put it. So, I mean, there's no doubt about it, it's more convenient. And something I was reading um, that someone had said when I'd said, let's make buses more sexy or sexy full stop, um, is that someone said, Carmen, buses are not sexy, buses are for poor, therefore the people who are in poverty, you, you don't choose to get a bus, you get a bus because you have no other option. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, you know, that's terrible. Um, this is what, it's not my opinion, but this is what this person was saying. And of course, for a lot of people, that is their reality. We are privileged to have a car. A lot of people can't even afford a car. But um, what I'm saying is we need to change a lot of things. I mean, a lot of these questions we have, which I thought were fair and reasonable, and okay, I do perhaps ask a bit too many questions sometimes, but we are, a lot of our submitters have complained around Prince's Street and the bus lane. Bus lanes do work well and can be very, very good. But I thought that was a fair and reasonable question to ask because people are concerned about the parking along there, is... How, you know, it should be easy to say how many parks will go along there, but we couldn't get that answer. Things like that, it makes it very difficult to make a decision today when we don't have that information. And we talked a lot about data, but we didn't get a lot of data back. So I think some of those things... It's your five minutes, Councillor. Is it? Okay, thank you. Councillor Walker. <coughs> yep, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think it's, we'll go back to focusing on what's in front of us here again, and let's not forget what all these projects are about. It's for the benefit of the people of Dunedin. It's about minimising inevitable travel disruption around the hospital reconstruction. It's improving public transport journey times, better facilities for walking and cycling, to help move the city towards our own zero 2030 carbon zero goals, improving the harbour arterial, and achieving a significant number of deaths and injuries on the state highway network. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Um, this is not as some have made it out during questions and I imagine will continue during this debate of um, feeding the discourse of cars versus others. It's not. All the submission feedback from our public during the submission process favored these projects other than the Princess Street bus priority lane, and that was about 50-50. Parking. Yes, there are a number of people who commented on parking and the perceived um, shortage of it. This report uh, alludes to that not being the case. But find me a city anywhere in the world where you have a submission process and people will not moan about the <coughs> parking. You won't find one. But we are an elected governance team charged with making decisions on behalf of our residents using the best data and evidence we have to, to hand. Essentially, that's our job. Which brings me to attachment B in the parking roadmap. Probably not, not the best document for those, as the report state, and I quote, some city councillors who feel a responsibility to provide parking based on deep-rooted public expectations around the need for plentiful and affording, affordable parking to be provided by council. 
Doesn't make good reading, does it? Other issues? Yes, the report alludes to them. There are pinch points and hot spots of high occupancy. Welcome to a vibrant, growing city, folks. And the need, and it also points out the need for the city to start the process for developing a parking management policy. Seems like a fair request. However, on the flip side, park, it points out parking occupancy rates in central Dunedin are at 80 to 90 percent, well within an acceptable range. DCC provides a large amount of free or cheap all-day parking in comparison with other cities. DCC has a relatively large portfolio of off-street parking compared to similar sized cities. And even more troubling is that many of these assets allow for long-stay commuter parking at well below market rates of, of the private competitors. And did I mention that Dunedin has a large supply of on-street parking compared to other cities in New Zealand also? What does this all mean? Firstly, this is not an optimal, optimal use of land that has outcomes that are not aligned with the city's strategic objectives. And it's definitely undermining, quite seriously, our efforts to increase the proportion of journeys made by public transport and other sustainable modes. In fact, I, after reading the report, I asked my wife at home, how much is it to park in Dunedin for a day? She said, 20 to 25 bucks. When I told her it was six bucks, she nearly fell off of a chair. Councillor Houlihan, you are correct. It is too easy to drive. How are we ever going to encourage people to utilise alternatives when the easy option is so cheap and affordable when stacked up against the alternatives? And if we want the vibrant city that so many around this table crave, we should not be providing subsidised all-day parking at below market rate. We should be prioritising short-term customers. That's obvious. And to some councillors in the room, the report categorically states, and I once again quote, building additional off-street parking supply as recommended by some stakeholders is not recommended by this report. Can we put that one to bed, please? Although at 50, 50K a parking space, no surprise why a private, a private uh, enterprise doesn't come a knock in. That said, if we were to discontinue cheap, subsidised parking, in the vicinity of the new hospital, perhaps a private business would see some, some financial worth in building a parking building aligned with the new hospital. In closing, the report clearly states that as the city continues to grow, there needs to be increased investment in public transport, cycling, and other sustainable transport modes. And for me, this is not pitching to one, one group against the other. The beneficiaries of doing this are better options for those who want alternatives, but as importantly, as I mentioned earlier, less parking and roading pressure for those whose only alternative is to use a motor vehicle. Everyone in wins there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reddick. Well, um, feedback from the Shaping Future Dunedin Transport 2020 uh, survey of the population whilst it didn't address the issue of parking very much, the first item mentioned in the key themes from that engagement was provide more all-day commuter parking, including park and ride facilities around the edge of the central city and within walking distance of major destinations and places of work, which was echoed by many stakeholders in the, in the interviews carried out for this work. And of course, sufficient parking for the new Dunedin Hospital was a particular topic of concern. And Dunedin, in fact, has a very high uh, usage of uh, alternative modes. We have quite a few cyclists. We have a lot of people, one of the highest usages of walking and jogging to get to work in the country. But we also have a growing population of cars. There is more and more car usage in Dunedin, not less. And to me, the th the way to approach this is to make it easier to use alternative modes because Dunedin clearly has a desire to use alternative modes and chiefly amongst them is EV cars to reduce our carbon footprint. So the, uh, the, the other thing that we noticed is that residential streets are now getting more and more cars parking in them as we take 
car parking out of the central city. So we have the unintended consequences of making people even, you know, more remotely, more remote from the city centre, uh, affected by the lack of parking in the centre city. The solution to this is to build some car parking on the edge of the CBD. And what we've got here instead is a range of projects <clears throat> which I do not agree with, starting with the parking management, which will simply attract more cars into the centre of, city, centre of the city and create more congestion. It is the exact opposite of our livability city goals and our carbon zero target. And an enormous waste of money at 9.5 million, that amount of money would build 250 odd car parks on the periphery in a parking building. The next one is the Princess Street Bus Priority and Corridor Safety Plan, the least popular of any of these initiatives, which was very likely to take a lot of car parks out of Princess Street, and for what? A few seconds or possibly minutes gained in, in speed, transit speed for a bus, of which are you know, very lightly occupied currently. But the buses uh, can transit that street not too bad at the moment, but as was suggested by a very prominent bus driver, that a simple light changing mechanism that the bus driver could control would have far greater benefit for much lesser cost. So I think we're chasing down a blind alley there with that one. The central cycleway and pedestrian safety, similarly, six and a half million dollars. Uh, but to take more car parks, out, especially out of George Street, but also a bunch of others. So I'm very dubious about that and how much benefit that that will bring, how many extra cyclists that will give us because currently we have a very slowly increasing population of cyclists on the road. And bear in mind so that, that's another six and a half million dollars and added to the six and a half million for the Princess Street bus corridor. The bike hubs, that is something I can subscribe to. Two and a half million dollars, uh, possibly part funded by Waka Katahi and that giving people a place to safely store their bikes, I think, would be very helpful to increase mode shift. But um, the harbour arterial, similarly, I can subscribe to because that will decongest the one-way system because the uh, advent of the Barnes dancers across the one-way system has meant that there's now quite a bit of congestion on that one-way system, so providing an alternate route will be very helpful, and similarly, if the one-way system ever has to close during the hospital rebuild, there will be an alternate route to get uh, traffic channeled to and fro. However, the, with the money saved from the majority of this program, we could build a heck of a lot of car parks on the periphery of the city, of the CBD. They could be EV prioritised. It would do far more to help us with our carbon zero goals and encourage mode shift as people would be able to walk from that car park into the city and that would free up it's the city car minutes, parks Councilor. for shoppers putting commuters on the edge. Further speakers? Councillor Wiley. I believe this vote is about the future of, of transport and parking in our city. Dunedin's population is projected to grow, as we've seen, to 138,674 in 2028. So going through these items one by one, um, the harbour arterial efficiency I will support, the settle, central city parking management I will not support, as I see this as 9.5 million being a parking expense and not improving parking assets. The Princess Street car park bus priority and corridor safety I will not support, the central cycle and pedestrian improvements I will support. Park and ride facilities I will not support. I see that an express bus service to and from Mosgiel is vital, but I believe many will travel to Burnside but will continue on driving into town. Park and ride is suited closer to the start of the journey rather than three quarters of the way into town. The central city bike hubs I will support. The lack of certainty around no clear indication of building a new car park building in Dunedin is a major concern for me. Now remember, we have already lost 250 car parks in the two-storey Wilson parking building on the corner of St Andrew and Cumberland Streets. 
with the 90 car parks being lost at Cumberland and Hanover Street, plus the soon loss of Dowling Street car park. In December 2016, the current councillors, many that are still sitting around this table, all apart Council of Andavis, supported selling the Frederick Street car park to the ACC to develop a car park building with their offices. Remember, they supported building a car park building. Residents' Opinion Survey 2019-20 reported report repaired by Gravitas showed that the number one concern of our residents was the need for more parking. That was a need for more parking. Just to refresh your memories, that was item eight in the agenda from the 27th of January meeting. I'm deeply concerned about our city and our new hospital. The Dunedin Hospital Master Plan included a figure of 250 parks. That was Pete Hodson in August last year. As a comparison, Waikato Hospital has 2,785 parks. Palmerston North Hospital has more than 650 parks, and that's just for the public. Wellington Regional Hospital has 1,555 car parks, 540 for public spaces. And a Beehive press release from the 11th of September 2020, a government brokered solution to the parking woes at Christchurch Hospital will deliver more than 1,000 new car parks near the hospital for staff and visitors. Dunedin Public Hospital is going to be a regional hospital. It's going to be a tertiary hospital. It's going to be a destination hospital. It requires parking with all the out-of-town visitors. Are we expecting that people from out of town are going to pull into Burnside, catch a bus and go to the hospital? I don't think so. It is vital that we provide adequate, safe car parking for all hospital staff near the new hospital. The, the only reason I can see that the government wouldn't be partnering with the Dunedin City Council and clearly articulating appropriate parking plans would be if they were preparing to downgrade the hospital and not expect so many out-of-town visitors. It seems like we consistently hear about the size of the hospital and its shrink capacity is shrinking. If you are truly supporting that the new hospital is going to be one of the country's leading regional hospitals, then you would be supporting the associate infrastructure that goes with it. Building 250 car parks for a new hospital does not give me confidence that we are going to have an internationally regarded regional hospital. The construction industry also note the importance of car parking while the new hospital is being constructed. There'll be many trades vehicles to be located in a very close proximity to the construction site. Overall, I'm listening to the residents, both through the submissions to our long-term plan and to our resident survey. And I think we are undervaluing the importance of parking in this city. Through the speakers. Councillor Gary and Councillor Staines. Thank you, Your Worship. I have listened to the arguments around the table and the comment I would make to you is that we probably all agree on more than we disagree, even though that wouldn't be perhaps evident. I would imagine that we all agree that we want to be able to, our, our residents to be able to move around the city uh, freely, no matter what their choice of transportation mode is. I would imagine we would agree that those who need to use private motor vehicles, be they elderly or disabled, we want them to be able to move around the city in particular. And I would imagine we'd agree that we want everyone to be safe, no matter what mode of transport they choose. For me, these projects address some of that. And what we heard was the, the projects are interrelated, they're integrated. We need the suite of projects. We can't pick and choose and expect the same outcome. In fact, the outcome that many of those opposed are wanting. So there's six projects, two of which traverse bus travel, two of which traverse cycling, and two are around vehicle movements. And the ones that are to do with cycling uh, address issues of security, and we did hear that in submissions quite loudly that those who have electric bikes, one of the reasons they aren't bringing them to town is the issue of having a secure place to park them. And safety for our cyclists, and we heard from cyclists and I have heard outside the submission process often that there are a lot of people who would cycle and they're waiting on the completion of the cycleways, the linking up of them uh, and uh, the safe ability to safely cycle around the city was an element in not uh, cycling. So I would expect once we complete that, we'll get a much greater uptake. That's certainly what I heard in submissions. 
Um, so not only are these projects integrated, but the matter of parking, which some of you choose to pick out and focus on every time there's a project that loses parking, uh, and focus on uh, as being um, the one true saviour uh, of all of this. And if you read the Cagney report, you should be in no doubt that it's not that simple, and that in fact um, you can't just say, uh, if you add parking, that will solve everything. I would suggest uh, to councillors who, or in particular Councillor uh, Houlihan, who talked about the comms, that in fact we should be leading those comms. And it's the way we talk about this. Uh, I would suggest to those councillors who keep focusing on parking um, and that that being the solution, which it is not, clearly, from the Cagney report, um, that they would do well to focus on the evidence, on facts, and lead uh, the conversation in the comms. Stop scaremongering. There are people in our community, and I speak from experience, and it makes me really angry. Our household has to use a private motor vehicle to get around because one of our household, one of our family, has a mobility issue, and you might expect that I would be saying, oh gee, uh, there isn't enough parking, there isn't enough parking. Well, in fact, I support all of these projects because they will deliver the outcome of making sure that those who, get out of, who can get out of their cars can, and those who can't uh, have a much easier ride. And so I am in totally in support of this Something I learned a long time ago in my time in local government is don't tell our folk, our staff, how to get to the outcome we're asking for. Um, they are best placed to advise us on that. Um, simply ask what the outcome is we want and get them to recommend how we get there. And that is exactly what they've done. I thank them for their work. Thank you, Councillor Staines. <laughs> thank you, Your Worship. We're here today to deliberate over the 10-year plan, the long-term plan. And we probably had the widest consultation and the greatest number of submissions we have ever had. It's interesting then, when you look at these projects and their support, it's pretty clear that there's very strong support for four of the projects, and it's also very clear when you look at where the support is coming from in terms of the method of submission, the traditional submission method in all of those cases, while supportive, is less than the, the support shown on the social media channels. My own personal view is that the younger people who are more likely to use those social media channels are telling us very clearly, there were, there were thousands of submissions, telling us clearly they want to see these projects go ahead such that it will reduce our carbon footprint and make it easier for us to live in this city. If I take a small journey into the two that didn't get support to the same level, by Cubs, well, 54% of traditional submissions were in favour, 61% of YouTube, and 85% on Twitter. So it's hardly not supported. Go to the bus lane. I think here we might have a problem. Only 48% of the traditional submissions, and 55 and 69% of the social media channel submissions were in favour of this. But I suspect that's because there is a degree of misunderstanding of what is intended, and I think I could see that around the table today during questioning. We are all a little bit unsure of just what it means. But you have to look at what is the desired outcome of this. It is that the commuters, the people that we're trying to get onto buses, very much so are commuters, will have a fast and reliable service. If the service isn't fast and reliable, they don't want to use it. So, if we can make those, that bus journey fast, comfortable, reliable, then I think we have every right 
to start to put up the cost of parking in the surrounding areas of our CBD. As has been mentioned earlier, the, the cost for all day parking is ludicrous. It does nothing to encourage someone to leave their car at home. It fills up the parks that our elderly and disabled need in order to do the business they wish to do in town. They aren't always able to use the public transport system because of disabilities. So my view is we need to do these things, then we need to take perhaps the, more, the less um, desirable steps from some members of the community and actually encourage people to use these services by increasing the cost of bringing your car into the city. So I'll be voting in favour. Councillor Lofuisel. Tēnā Your Worship. Uh, I firstly like to record my thanks to the staff. Um, I think they should get a patience performance bonus for dealing with uh, elected members who don't read the reports. Um, secondly, um, you know, the, every time we have these kind of discussions, you know, it's always talked about or mostly framed in terms of ideology. Everything we do is ideological. And even what we define as sensible or wasteful is ideological. So, and also what we de define as simplistic is ideological. The four wheels bad, two wheels good uh, description is just simplistic. Uh, because what about the people uh, on two feet or two legs or not, or, or less than that? What about people in, wheelchair, in wheelchairs? So I'd just like to, uh, and I've said this before, the whakatauki, he aha te meao nui o te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata, what is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. And I'd just like to quote... Um, Justice Joe Williams' whakaro in 2018 on this whakatauki. People who misquote the context think of it's the people today. But in actual fact, Justice Joe Williams talked about um, the ancestress who, who originally uh, said this uh, whakatauki. She was talking about the future generations. So I commend the mover and those of my colleagues who actually understand that we need to focus again on this as a suite. We cannot pick and choose if we are serious about leading for the future. That's our job. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's, and, and you look at the end, there's a huge suite of things that are proposed through the ORC and others, and Waka Kotahi. And it's not just this group of things that will change things, it's the bigger suite of things. I can generally support this, and I'll talk to each one as we go along. Harbour arterial efficiency improvements, are necessary to get, create a bypass for heavy traffic. And in fact, a lot of that is happening already, so I can support that. The central city parking management, I can support, but I do urge the city to be proactive in working with the hospital in creating a parking building. And I have talked to many hospital workers who believe this is urgently needed. I look at Christchurch, who didn't proactively work on this, and the government brokered a solution to the parking woes of Christchurch Hospital um, with the delivery of a thousand new car parks near the hospital for staff and visitors. And one of the big worries that I get back from people is I talk to someone who's actually green and left-leaning, who said, they had to drop their um, elderly mother off to the emergency department, leave her there and go around the block because they've already gone around the block twice. And we can't have that. I, I, I believe there is a real concern around that area. We only have a very narrow corridor for traffic to go through the city. We are 
a regional and hub, and also we have the fifth largest geographical size city in New Zealand. That means we've got Middlemarch, we've got Outram, we've got Waikowaiti, Karatani, we've got the peninsula in West Harbour, many of whom need to come in for these kind of things. We also um, have a growing older population. And again, these people, I talked to someone the other day at Mosgiel and he said, the bus hub's really good, it gets me in really well, but it takes me half an hour to walk to the hospital. Half an hour to walk to the hospital. I believe we do need to be proactive in this space. I believe that we do need to think about how we might do it. And I note Kai Tahu actually worked with the hospital in um, Christchurch to create a park right next door. My other concern, and I think working proactively this will help, is that tourism's going to change. And I note that 71% of Australian visitors who come are self-drive. I would like them to have a landing place where they could actually hire a bike or a scooter or whatever um, to actually move about the city in a different way. And whether that be central city with the um, hospital or whether that be, like um, Jules said, uh, maybe a parking space outside of that, but I believe that would be a good option. So I can support the city, central city parking management system as long as we urgently address the, the, the perceived and known need for people to access the hospital easily. The Princess Street parking priority and corridor safety plan, I don't believe we communicated that very well and I would like to see more work done on that and go back to the community for it. The central city cycle and pedestrian improvements, I can support that. I'm a cyclist and I think that needs to be done. Uh, park and ride facilities, I believe some more work needs to be done and I would like to see more work done on that. I believe that quite often people, if they get in a car, will go not park and ride. So I'd like some more work. I, I, I agree that park and ride does have some merits. So yeah, I, can, I suppose I can support that. Central City Bike Hubs, um, parking and facilities, I definitely support that. If we want people to change their mode, then we definitely need to provide um, cycling hubs because in fact, a lot of cycles cost over $4,000. That's your five minutes, perfectly timed, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. Like James Joyce's Ulysses, this has been a, a long process of consciousness and conscience over many, many meetings. I support all six projects as an integrated suite to help everyone to get around the city easily. Councillor Raddick absolutely hit the nail on the head when he said we need to make it easier for people to use alternative modes of transport, and this will deliver this. Councillor Houlihan has talked about um, better marketing of buses, and I totally agree. As a bus user, I'm not poor, but I do use the bus, and it is very convenient. We, uh, last week, we did um, submit to the ORC that we do want to get the buses back, and maybe we will be able to take them over and do better marketing to get sexy people on the bus. Um, Councillor Vandiver said that this was going to cost us $53 million, and I asked earlier about the Waka Kotahi, so I think the total um, capex is around 28 million, so I just want to have clarification around that for anybody listening. The consultation pro um, feedback that we had supported all um, six projects, and I can't believe that any councillors would vote against the um, Central City Parking Manager as Management, as Councillor Raddick said. If we do the parking changes, it will attract more people into the central city and said that as a negative, and I think that's a positive. When we look at what's happening in George Street, we were concerned that people wouldn't go there, so I think this is a, a very positive step forward. Any further speakers? Anyone left? What? Um, oh, we'll get to the end of the debate and then we'll vote on it. That's usually how it works. 
I, uh, I will speak to this briefly, oh, probably not even briefly. Um, there was an opinion piece on the front page of the newspaper on Saturday uh, that talked about a showdown looming in terms of our transport decisions, and that is absolutely right. Uh, we have uh, the choice to decide whether we uh, design our, our cities for the future uh, or whether we design our cities uh, for the past. Uh, and that is as, is as true of our transport network as it is uh, for our planning uh, and, and how we manage the city. And one of the challenges we have is that human beings aren't particularly um, hardwired towards dealing with abstraction. Uh, and we know that anyone who's been in a, involved in a campaign to stop something or save something uh, will know that that's a whole lot easier to do than it is to generate support for new alternatives. And that is one of the biggest challenges uh, of the climate action movement, is that we need to be painting a picture of what alternative options are for people. But one of the few direct, tangible things that we can do as a local authority in contributing uh, to that work uh, is through the transport network. Uh, and the contribution that that can make to our zero carbon goals are obvious, but I do want to remind people of the social implications uh, of the decisions that we make around our transport network. Uh, and because those who seek to entrench the status quo and the people it serves are tacitly endorsing, uh, the, uh, it's giving tacit endorsement to those who are excluded uh, from the status quo. And that, and that has been covered, people with disabilities and impairments, uh, children and young people, people who can't afford to drive, uh, a growing number of people who choose not to. And yes, there are a group of people for whom the current alternatives in the state that they are, can, they can make it work for them. Uh, but there's equally a, a large group of people uh, who would love to, uh, but it hasn't been made attractive enough. Councillor Hulhan's right when she says we should be um, focusing on what the benefits of walking and cycling. Well, the number one benefit of walking and cycling would be being able to do that without fear of death or serious injury. And that is the kind of work uh, that we're trying to do. Uh, we need to demonstrate uh, our commitment to, to social and environmental uh, well-being in our community. And these, this set of projects uh, is an obvious place for us to do that. Um, I was thinking this morning about uh, John McKenzie and, and his submission um, uh, through the 10-year plan and he basically laid down the challenge to us, what are we doing for young people uh, in, our, in our community? And often, you know, we talk about what that means in terms of urban design or transport or recreation opportunities or, or facilities, um, but I think it does them a disservice because especially the, the largest, largest group of young people I remember certainly turning up and presenting to us uh, as part of this budget process. And it makes me cringe, if I'm honest, uh, when the Youth Council come and talk to us about what matters to them and the first question they get asked is, what do you reckon about playgrounds? Because they have higher order concerns, uh, existential concerns about how we manage uh, our natural environment and, and they want us and we've seen them thousands marching in the street. They want us uh, to be more ambitious and act with a greater degree of urgency around, uh, around climate action, of which transport is the single biggest driver, no pun intended, that we have available uh, to us. Um, we can't do it alone, absolutely not. Uh, we also need Waka Kotahi and the Otago Regional Council uh, to be ambitious about how they see the future of uh, the transport network in the city, in, in particular uh, in the city centre. Uh, and using the, the construction of the Newton Eden Hospital as a catalyst uh, for a literally once in a generation opportunity to rethink uh, how, us, how people get to and through uh, the city centre. We will also need to do more. This is absolutely not uh, going to deliver where we need to get to, but it is absolutely a start. Um, the subject of convenience has been raised, and um, I can speak to this with some uh, authority. Is it? It, is it convenient uh, to not drive a private, private motor vehicle? Absolutely not. Uh, but I tell you what's less convenient is uh, having your, what is, uh, God, sorry. What is less convenient is being separated from your family and your places of business, and your friends, and social connections by way of extreme weather events, like we have seen in Canterbury. And I want to acknowledge uh, those communities, actually, because that is what we are talking about when we talk about seeing more frequent 
and more intense extreme weather events as a result of having a less stable climate and building a safer climate future. And we talk, we obsess about the supply side of car parking as if that is the only site, the contested site for us to have this debate. And, and, and you know, the concept of induced demand shouldn't be new to many of us. It reminds me you know, of the transport planners in Los Angeles, we'll just add one more lane to the motorway, we'll just add one more lane to the motorway, one more car parking building, and what happens? The, the demand expands to fill the resource that you make available for it. It is, it, is, it is reductive and simplistic, and it is not going to achieve any of the uh, strategic objectives of the city by focusing solely uh, on the supply side of parking uh, in the city centre. Um, I, I can't wait for more ambitious projects to come forward to deliver on these, but this is absolutely the direction that we need to be travelling in uh, when we think about the future of uh, Dunedin Transport. Sure. Councillor O'Malley, your right of reply. Your Worship. I'm going to start out by directly responding to some of the statements that went on in the debate. Obviously, there's the right of reply. Um, the idea that cycleways are causing congestion. Um, Thomas Burns Drive does not have a cycleway on it. Portsmouth Drive does not have a cycleway on it. It has one next to it. The cycleways, are even on the one-way system, were took out parking. They didn't take out lanes. And the Southern Motorway does not have cycleways on it at all. And yet, all of those areas are showing massive congestion during the rush hour now. To blame cycleways for growth and use of the transit system is just to simply head off in the wrong direction because you want to believe in something because you don't want to face the reality in front of you. We got double Victorian on that one. Now, the idea that you can shoot into town from Mosgill, again, Nobody's driven that road at 5 o'clock and believes you can shoot in or back, and nobody's driven it at 8.30 in the movie and you can shoot in. That time is over. That was the no-growth Dunedin time. That was the Dunedin dying on its feet time. That's when you could shoot in, because there was nobody there. This town, well, the city is growing, and we cannot keep ignoring it, and we can't keep using the symptoms of its growth as being an excuse for why we don't want people on bikes. I acknowledge that there is a need for a traffic management plan to come with the hospital rebuild and we, and we have not been necessarily vocalising that to the extent that the pu pu public are confident that we are on top of it. And I do think we need clearer messaging and we need clearer outcomes that people can be confident that we, that we are in fact doing the right thing there. I want to clarify that the difference between satellite parking and park and ride. Park and ride is miles out of town and then you come in on transport. If you drive within walking distance and park there, you are not on a park and ride, you're at a satellite park. Two different outcomes. There are only one Barnes dance on the one-way system and they are at Albany Street. The rest of the crossings are standard crossings. We have not put in any new crossings on the one-way system. So you cannot blame barn dances on the one-way system because they aren't there except at Albany Street. The GPS flagging of lights by the buses is in the design of the, of the, um, uh, the Princess Street bus priority lane. It is already in the design. I think there have been some situations where people have come and presented to us during the presentations and they have not fully understood the design. They've come up with the design in their own head and of course that design doesn't work. But that doesn't mean that's what's coming out. Um, going forward, one of the things that we have to face is that as we grow, we have to deal with the commute, one form or another. The commute and the commutor. Now, the whole idea of the park and ride is that, that we know a lot of our commute is coming from the south of the city. And so we're saying, if you have limited means, because at the moment what's happening is people who are well off, they're going to their private parking space in the middle of town. But the person who serves you in your store when you go to buy your expensive goods and he's or she are on minimum wage, they are trying to find a cheap park somewhere and they are parking all the way over as far as Portsmouth Drive and all the way up into the town belt. Now while building them a parking building won't work because they haven't got the money to go into it. Building them a park and ride at a distant site will work if we can make it cheap enough to get in. Now, Councillor Vandervis is shaking his head because I know for a fact that he has not been on the Mosgill bus at 4.30 like I have when it is packed. And at $4.50 each way, it is packed. When it was $2, it's super packed. When this is built, it will work. And I hope 
that those who say this will not work will stand next to it when that car park is full and those buses are full and they will say, I said this would not work because it's very easy to pull things down and then when they succeed, not admit that you actually tore it apart and tried to stop it from happening. I acknowledge the Chain Hill Tunnel Cycleway needs to get built and it's not on this, method, on this program. But I remind everyone this is the start of the journey, not the end of it. These are the things we have to do now. As I said earlier, we have to do our part um, in leaving the city ready for those who are coming in behind us. If we do not start this journey now, then those who come in behind, the ones who have gone to the octagon and said, what are you doing about the future? They came here as well. It is fear for them to say to us, it is fear of them to say to us, you aren't doing your part. It is not much point in declaring a climate emergency and setting carbon neutral 2030 dates and then not executing the work to go with it to meet those objectives. This is the start of the journey. We need to do much, much more. But to not do this is actually an irresponsible act towards our children, grandchildren and those not yet born. Thank you. I'll take, I'll take A and then we'll do Romans 1 through 6 by division. Seems like a safe bet, doesn't it? Um, so, part A, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. B, Romans 1. Oh, sorry, I've taken them by division. <laughs> <laughs> hope you've got enough sheets. That's what I was saying. So, um, Roman number 1 is approves the following programme will be retained in the 10 year plan. 2021-31, the Harbour Arterial Efficiency Improvements. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson-Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Yes. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor, oh, it's not here. Um, Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandivis? No. Councillor Walker? Aye. Councillor Wiley? Yes. Your Worship? Aye. Carried 12-2. Yeah. All of them, yeah. Uh, Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Councillor Elder? Aye. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? No. Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? No. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandivis? No. Councillor Walker? Councillor Wiley? No. Your Worship? Right. Carrie oh, 10, 10 4. Yeah. Romans 3, Princes, Streets, Bus Priority, and Corridor Safety Plan. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Councillor Elder? No. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? No. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandivis? No. Councillor Walker? Aye. Councillor Wiley? No. Your Worship? Aye. Carried 10-4. Oh, sorry. It's my fault. Apologies. Um, I had. Sorry, I must have um, put somebody as a as a as a yes. Okay, sorry. Apologies. Sorry. 
Sorry. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. This is before, is it? Three. Councillor Lofiso. Councillor Lord. Sorry, Liv, sorry, Murray. Was it yes or no? I was oh, sorry, 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 I just double check. Uh, Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Reddick. No. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. No. Your Worship. Aye. Nine five. Apologies. Apologies for that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I can just leave. Uh, <laughs> Romans four central central cycle and pedestrian improvements. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lofiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Reddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor um, Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 11 3. Robins 5. Park and Ride facilities, Mosgiel and Burnside. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Yes. Councillor Elder? Yes. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Aye. Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Reddick? No. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandervis? No. Councillor Walker? No. Councillor Wiley? No. Your Worship? Aye. Carried 11 3. And finally, uh, this Roman 6 Central City Bike comes parking and facilities. Okay. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Councillor Elder? Aye. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Reddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 13-1. Thank you. Um, Councillor Benson Pope, your consequential motion has been provided, has it? Yes. Can we see that now, please? It's been moved by Councillor Benson Pope and seconded by Councillor Walker. May I? Yes, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the um, <clears throat> The Cagney report, I think, is one of the most important documents that we've seen amongst many um, in recent times. And I was absolutely delighted um, to receive this because it provides us with an extraordinary amount of background. <clears throat> and colleagues will have noticed the um, quite erudite and clear identification of a, a whole raft of issues around the matters we've just been discussing and have consulted with our community on which we've consulted with our community as well. And most importantly, in my view, it differentiates very clearly between the needs of short-term and long-term parking. The mess of the parking debate and what there is or isn't has been long confused by the lack of differentiation between the needs. Many of you were at the um, Chamber of Commerce when they told us to not 
to do away with the free parking that we had during the height of COVID because it was being used by the staff in stores rather than as intended for shoppers. And that was a good example of the sort of bad behaviour and the problems that we see around that issue. The other good thing about the Cagney report, apart from its fulsomeness, is that it puts to bed a lot of the myths that have been perpetrated by people in the community, including some of our colleagues here around this table. We are very fortunate about the provision of parking and the level of parking provision in this city. And the issues around parking need to be further teased out and refined by way of what that report also recommends. And it's the lack of the early things that we've just agreed to, and I must say I'm heartened by the good sense that the majority of the council is showing around those directions, but they are just part of the journey that we need to start on, that we have started on. The rest of it is the development of work to keep getting it right and to manage the challenges as they evolve. Part of that, <clears throat> one of the recommendations, of course, around the development of the parking management plan, it's obvious, and it's on, on page 137 of the report I referred to it earlier, page 8 of the appendix, we've already committed to the first one, the first extra one, developing a way, wayfinding signage. But there are lots of elements in those further recommendations that may or may not cost something, um, but they need attention, and that's why... Um, I'm moving to request uh, that the Chief Executive produce for us a work plan for implementation of the remainder of those recommendations in the roadmap. Uh, clearly that will come back to a committee for consideration, debate and, um, and any funding issues if they can't always, always be managed internally. But I think it is essential when we have at last such a cornerstone report to base our decisions on that we actually do that work. And the good thing about the Cagney report, when I first read it, I, I was really pleased with it and the conciseness of it until I got to this suggestion of developing <coughs> our parking management plan because I immediately thought what more delay, but these people are on the job and they immediately recommended um, the interim work that can be proceeded with while that longer process um, is carried out. And I, I think that's entirely positive. Uh, and as I said, if you have any doubts about the professionalism in the background of this consultancy group, look them up on the web. Uh, they're not only uh, of a considerable depth but wide reach and they have a lot of research documents you'll find very interesting about alternate vehicles as well um, should you wish to read them during the next few days or at home so um, thank everyone for their uh, vision in the previous debate this to me is the natural continuation of the information that we have and the teasing out of the best way to provide our residents, all of them, with the sort of access to the city that they need and want. Councillor Wiley. Um, I'm, I'm okay with this. I'm just conscious of the timing. Uh, and will the work plan be, is there enough time for it to come back to Council? I checked with staff at the break and they are comfortable that they can have a, a high level work plan that will um, show, because there's six or seven resolutions in the report and an outline of what will be involved for each of them. It won't be in a granular detail, but it will be enough. Councillor Walker. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Uh, there's not much I can add to the excellent summation uh, just put forward by the councillor to my right. Um, it is a fantastic and much needed report which answers a lot of questions um, or myths that have emanated around this table over, over the time I've been here actually and as Councillor Benson uh, Pope quite rightly points out it, um, it, it points out some of the easy measures particularly around the, the long term, short term parking issues and definitely around uh, the cost of all day parking. Those are, those are probably some short-term, easy fixes we can take. 
um, and I look forward to um, everyone supporting this and uh, the work going forward. Also, and just further to uh, Mr. Drew's comments earlier, I'm glad to see Part B that we've now rested it back to the Planning and Environment Committee and not infrastructure, so thank you. Councillor Elder. I've got a, uh, can I ask a question of um, Simon, uh, of the Chief Executive? Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that report. I think it's got a lot of good things to say. But um, my concern is that we're putting that report and putting their work plan as a priority when we haven't... Um, no, I, I'm just asking. Um, and whether, in fact, um, first of all, we need to go back to staff on this because um, we're putting priorities in which they haven't actually speculated. Spe Councillor, the, the question has been asked, is it, is it achievable by staff? And the answer has been yes. If there were concerns from... Okay. Councillor, I spoke to staff at lunchtime and they advised me that this time frame was achievable. Okay. Yeah, I was just w wanting to clarify that a bit more. So, thank you. Councillor Adams. Of the Chief Executive, it's achievable by staff. Has it been consulted on? Do we have the right to actually push through this out of the blue series of suggestions. Is the question, does this meet the threshold as set by the significance and engagement policy which requires us to go through a formal consultation process? This isn't a new level of service, councillor. So it's an operational matter and it's about prioritising operational resource. So what you're saying is that we don't need to consult on any of these seven recommendations? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the development of a work programme um, doesn't trigger significance and that staff will bring that back to the committee on the 3rd of August where the committee will be able to consider what's been proposed. And will consultation be possible at that stage then? Well, I, I haven't reviewed in any detail the recommendations in the MR Cagney report and so what comes back to you on the 3rd of August will enable our conversation about what each of the recommendations might entail. Thank you. My other question um, related to that, that's coming back on the 3rd of August, and that's great, um, is does it require to do this significant capital cost which would need to be added to the budget? To put together a work plan, no. There'll be staff time. Okay, Councillor Barker. <laughs> All I can say is about bloody time. I have mentioned before the 2009 parking strategy, which identified that two statements that appeared repeatedly in the interviews was a desire by people in Dunedin to park right outside where they are going, and Dunedin people expect parking to be free. Many of the responses in the CBD survey show a tendency to lump these two together, convenient and free as a desired parking state, and who can blame them? This parking demand increases the volume of traffic in destination areas as well as the amount of traffic circulation and distraction as people drive around looking for a convenient on-street parking space. This all has a negative effect on road safety, particularly for vulnerable users in the central city and urban amenity. Demand for free and convenient on and off-street parking in the central city and some centres is difficult to cater for within the, with the existing levels of car use in Dunedin. It also conflicts with other priorities and objectives such as providing pedestrian and cycling infrastructure and improving the safety and amenity of the urban environment. I read that out of the 2013 Integrated Transport Strategy, which also says that we should put a parking management policy to give effect to this, so hence about bloody time. Thank you. Three speakers in favour. Any speakers against? Councillor Houlihan. Anyone would like to speak against the motion? Councillor Vanivers. I don't believe it's appropriate for us, having just passed six fairly comprehensive and staff uh, already worked out 
uh, motions regarding traffic and parking, for us now to lump in along with that a whole bunch of uh, a singular consultant's view of what we should be doing. Um, I don't see that staff have had any input into this. I don't see that the public have had any opportunity to consult on any of uh, this proposal. Uh, to me, this is just simply a consultant's view and uh, for us to uh, not even debate it and just say, oh, we're going to do all of this in addition to the stuff that we've debated, in addition to the stuff that our staff have worked out, uh, is to simply in impose a, an outside consultant's view on the public of the need and without consultation or even uh, due consideration. It's come out of left field. I don't believe it's appropriate and won't be voting for it. The right of reply, Councillor. Thank you. Um, timely, Your Worship, because it's the previous speaker, of course, wasn't telling the truth. This is not a commitment to doing... Point of order. I've been accused by Councillor Benson Pope of not telling the truth. I ask him to unreservedly withdraw well, and apologise. Councillor, that's hard to know before we hear the end of the sentence, I would imagine. So let's hear the end of the sentence, shall we? And then we'll make a no, decision. No, let's not. Let's deal with the point of okay. order. Councillor Benson Pope, would you like to speak to the point of order? Um, yes, the, the councillor quite clearly suggested that this, re, this, this remit that I've moved was actually committing staff, staff and the council to implement this work. That is not what it says. That's it's not what a, I said. A, I haven't finished. It's about developing a work plan for implementation, implementing the recommendations at such time as it, re it returns to the Planning and, Com and Environment Committee and Council, then there will be a Council decision to either proceed with that implementation or not. And the, the Speaker said several times, that suggested several times that this work was being committed should we agree to that. That is not true. I did not use those words, and you have accused me of publicly telling an untruth. You must withdraw and apologise. Well, I'll, I'll make the decisions, I think. But um, I, I think there, there appears to me um, to be a misunderstanding about what is being asked here. And I think Councillor Benson Pope is right in that there is nothing in this resolution that, that, that commits staff to doing anything around the recommendations beyond putting together a work plan uh, for us to make decisions around uh, what we end up doing, uh, doing with it. Um, so at the very least, uh, Councillor Van Evers, it was a mischaracterisation of what I believe uh, to be uh, before us at this point. Um, I'm, I'm not going to uphold the point of order, but I would welcome the councillor to continue in his right of reply. Um, thank you, um, Your Worship. I, um, I think the important, I think the important thing to remember is that, as several people said during the discussion, what we agreed in the previous debate is the beginning of a lot of work that needs to be attended to. The most important thing for me about the recommendations from a most comprehensive uh, and interesting report is, as Councillor Barker just observed, the number of times the report illustrated what we had been advised to do. It is about time we actually got on and took the advice of the experts, our own staff and expert consultants, to address the problems and issues that we have in this area. Thank you. I'll put the motion on. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Aye. Uh, division, please. I'll take it by division. Why change now? Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Councillor Elder? Aye. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? No. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Walker? Aye. Councillor Wiley? Yes. Your Worship? Aye. Carried 11 2. Thank you. We 
Uh, we are now on item 14, which is page 211 of your papers. Waterfront Bridge, Dr. Hazelton. Ms. Weekloader, welcome. Any... Thank you, Councillor Lord. <laughs> See, you're trying to start one up there too. It's a baby one. Councillor. <laughs> Anything by way of introduction from either of you? We're happy to take it as read and go straight to questions. There's no wrong answer, but some are better than others. Uh, questions, Councillors? Councillor Vincent Pope. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Wish it. Uh, earlier on, I don't think you were here, um, unfortunately, but the question was raised in, res in response to discussions about the harbour arterial changes that um, the separation, the obstacle of the highway and the rest of it um, would be a greater risk in respect of access to the harbour. Um, have you considered those other transport changes which we have just um, approved in terms of their effect on the structure in whatever form it may proceed? Uh, not yet, but that will be done as part of this redesign okay. work. Thank you. Councillor Hulahan. It's probably a question for um, the CEO, given um, the two staff members weren't here when this decision was made. But um, my understanding was um, we were got on point one on here, whereas the purpose to update and it talks about mana fina were in. Well, my understanding was when we were faced with that council meeting around COVID and we put things on hold, that this was put on hold. We lost the funding for almost 20 million from the PGF fund, and we said that it was going, you know, sort of pretty much just put aside. And we didn't agree to do extra work on that. That was my understanding on it. On, 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 at the meeting on the, meeting on the 14th of December, a council resolved to instruct staff to work with other stakeholders to review the scope of the project, etc. It's on paragraph 11 on the paper. Well, that's not my understanding of that meeting and what was agreed. But the, the resolution is there, councillor. Okay, the paragraph 11, whatever, you control the meeting. That is the function of the chair, correct. Okay, Councillor, you seem to be conflating a resolution that you haven't seen in paragraph 11 on this report that speaks to the work that we're doing ongoing uh, with a decision that Council made to not accept the funding uh, that was offered through, uh, through the Provincial Growth Fund. It wasn't lost, we chose not to take it up given the, the wider context. But on the, and paragraph 11 is the resolution um, for you. Are there further questions? Councillor Elder. Um, I've had a number of comments from cyclists about this area and the complexity of it and also the danger of it. So in scoping this out, are we going to start from scratch given we are not following the exact reference from the last design? Uh, my understanding is that we will start with the, uh, the beginning point, the end point of where the bridge would go. We're not reconsidering whether there is a bridge, but it's the design of that bridge that we will consider. And we'll also be looking at the areas leading up to it. And obviously with the resolutions that have just come through, along with some additional work that you know, we've, we've noted here in terms of linking it through the exchange, etc., to link up with other opportunities, that will be considerable bit of redesign there, but you know, the actual location itself, that was not, that's not up for our grabs here. So it's more, um, say, where the starting points might be and where the landing points might be and how they fit in with current structures and whether, in fact, the harbour arterial route affects that as well. Within the very tight constraints that we have with yes. the land space. Yes, yes it's not big, is it? Yes.
Sharpen, take a breath from Councillor Raddick. <laughs> is there any so a question for the Chief Executive, possibly? Is there any scope within this agenda item to uh, call a halt to this project now? Oh, Firstly, for scope. I'd like to ask a a similar question, we'll see if we can't answer both of them at once. Would removing uh, a capital project of this scale from our long-term plan be considered significant per the policy? It could be two questions. I, I would have to check that, likely it would be. So that would, but so my initial um, answer to, to that is yes, it would tr trigger significance given that we um, consulted on it specifically, but I would want to confirm that. Um, but the other thing is, um, we do, council has made um, no resolution to cease this project. And so staff are working, we made a resolution, or council made a res resolution in May 2020 to decline the PGF funding, but um, bridge funding was independent of that. So that, that funding was for the broader waterfront front redevelopment work. Council has always had money in its, um, or since the, the last plan, money in its budgets for this bridge. And so the, there's a current council decision um, that supports ongoing work with this bridge. And subsequently, on the 14th of December 2020, by a vote of 14 to 1, by the looks like, council voted to support the continuing of this work. And my question is, is there any scope in this meeting and with this agenda item to call a halt to this project now? Well, my, my interpretation of the significance and engagement policy would suggest not, because just, I mean, I know we focus on adding in projects as the trigger for significant decisions that require specific community consultation and feedback, but it's equally true in my understanding of removing projects from the plan. I'm happy for for us to get clarification, but um, mm. that may not happen today. No, I'd like some clarification, though. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, you could, a decision could be made by council to revoke the existing resolution or, or to re, you could you could resolve to to, to to remove the money from the budget subject to it meeting the um, thresholds of the significance and engagement policy which would be offer you no guarantee that the debate wouldn't be in vain um, but that would be an option so what would be required then to make that happen? Well, you, you draft a resolution and then find someone else to second it and then we debate it and then we vote on it. Thank you. Are there further questions? Oh, sorry, I have Councillor Parker and then Councillor Romani. Oh, my question was just confirming that and um, asking a question, that in 2018 did Council vote unanimously to support a maximum of $20 million for the Architecture Van Brandenburg Bridge? Feels like only yesterday, that's <laughs> mine. That is also my understanding, yeah. Councillor O'Malley. It's actually to the word scope in the resolution and the $20 million in the budget and how we did the consultation because we, the original consultation was in the context of going forward with the waterfront. And of course, now that context is gone. Are we still? Are we still? Have we still got the mandate under the consultation to go forward with this? Given that in this current scope, because because I actually did think that we were reviewing the scope of the project, not the project itself. Um, and I'm wondering if this report. Well, we're noting it anyway. I'm just wondering, as we move forward, are we consistent? That, that the fact that the, the items to which we were pinning this consultation are now gone, i.e. the waterfront development. Um, and did, so... The, yeah, it was, it was quite clear in the consultation document that it was on... I mean, the, the context was absolutely part of the public discourse. Yeah. But the, 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 what we 
specifically consulted on in the last 10-year plan was this as a discrete project. Yes, it was part of a bigger conversation, um, but I don't know if I don't know if there are audit implications or significance and engagement policy implications of the wider context changing. I think there was a fair amount of commentary and even questions asked by councillors at the time that that would people invest in the waterfront if a bridge of this size was not built. Therefore there was a linkage done and I, I, the document may have had u unique and, and separate parts to it but I don't think they were completely unlinked um, and I guess that's my question. It's a policy question, and, and like we've, we're happy yeah, to get a, I, advice. I'm not, I'm not really backing up Councillor Radich's commentary. I'm more one of exactly. Are we still? We've got 20 million sitting in the budget. Are we still planning on going ahead with a Van Brandenburg full architectural bridge with Mana Fenua input into the redesign, or are we going forward with a, a, a another bridge with Mana Fenua input into the design and Van Brandenburg? No, I, no, I understand your question better in terms of what the scope of the project is. So do you that's what resolution that's what staff are able to answer. Yeah. So the um, what we've done around the scope is spoken with Manafino as the resolution asked us to. And um, what they're interested in is having a conversation about the redesign of the bridge and not um, visiting the Van Brandenburg design. And so it could be a bridge of different costs. Like, I'm not saying it will be a bridge of different costs, but we are basically going to look at what's the best outcome for this bridge, and Mana Whenua are going to be involved in the design, and that's pretty much where we are at the moment. That's correct. Thank you. Councillor Elder, and then Councillor Benson Pope. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, now, if you look at the Harbour Aotearoa improvements, when finished in 26-27, um, and the implications for such a bridge, um, we're looking at that 9 million in 26-27, when in fact, I believe, well, w would it be wise to actually rescope this, given the changes, and actually not do it until those changes have happened with the harbour arterial route? That's the question I'm asking. I think you can easily do the two things at the same time and with the design talking to each other. Okay. The, um, now and there the, may be some benefit to that in terms of disruption to the area, etc. if we can get construction underway at a similar time. Okay, the, 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 cool for that. Um, now the other thing is, um, I know that lots of projects to get Waka Kotahi funding. And I was wondering, in the business case, what kind of Waka Kotahi funding would this attract? So um, there is, and I can be corrected, just a little bit. According to um, oh, <laughs> previous notes, there's oh, a 50%. There is. <laughs> oh. uh, so the detailed business case hasn't been finished. Um, no, sorry, the detailed business case has been finished. Um, the uh, indications were it's just a normal fire rate at 53%, I think, this year, dropping to 52 next year and 51 the following year. Yeah. And, and as with any of these debates, I know we're considering the 10-year budget as a whole, but there is no work budgeted for this until... 24, 25, which is design and then construction in 25, 26. So there's a bit of time to work through the rescoping. <coughs> Councillor Benson Pope. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Discussing the scope, it's my recollection that, in fact, the, the proposal for the bridge predated um, the wider development of hotel, university site, and so on. Um, and if I recall many conversations from Mr Taylor, it was always about what was at the end of the bridge. As he was then, yes. Yeah, as, he wa as he was then and will, will eternally remain in my mind, um, <laughs> that the bridge was uh, a proposal that was standalone at the initial point. And um, it, 
Is that your recollection of these events, even though you weren't here at the time, Dr Hazelton? It is my recollection. I, um, unfortunately, in my previous life, do recall actually having one of the first meetings between staff and um, architect Van Brandenburg on that proposed bridge, and that was about in 2010, so okay. it well predated those schemes. Thank you. And are you of the view that the reasons for the link clear of the roadway and the rail uh, that were the genesis of the bridge then are still valid? Correct, yes. Thank you. Councillor Hulhan. What are you proposing would be the cost for this now? The budget is set out on page, it's the next page after the resolution, page 213 of the papers, 18. There's no amendment to the previous 10 year plan budget being proposed. Councillor Reddick. What amount is it? 20 million. 20 million, so you're still keeping it at 20 million. Correct. Mm -hmm. Here's the decision on the budget is made by council. So the, there's no staff proposal to change it, um, but the, any decision around what the budget across the next 10 years in any department or any project is determined by the elected membership. Councillor Reddick. Uh, in the course of looking at the scope, you know, which has been happening since the previous revolution, resolution and today. Has there been any um, uh, view or has the, the old bridge that has, still has the approaches in place going from probably Roberts Street across to Vogel Street? You know, those approaches there, has mm -hmm. that been looked at? Is, I believe that uh, was looked at. Have a connection? I believe that was looked at as part of the um, business case previously and was discounted. Yes, but of course the circumstances have changed in terms of waterfront development, but would still, that, uh, those approaches, which would uh, make a big difference to the cost of a bridge, uh, be, would be still viable, would be highly viable as a shared path to connect to the harbour connection as opposed do you have a to question, this Councillor, do you have a question? It's, yes. been, it's, it's been considered and discounted in an earlier process. Do you have a, a follow-up question? Well, it was Apart from trying to redesign the bridge on the fly, which is what it sounds like. <laughs> it, it was discounted right in the beginning, but has it been looked at again in terms of the latest scope? No, we have not. Thank you. If I might, if I could draw councillors' attention to paragraph 22 of your report, which outlines the next steps, which is a reasonably comprehensive um, programme of work up until November 2021, which does not consider scale resources and timeframes. Buried on page four. Are there other questions? Councillor Elder. Um, one last question. Um, a number of people in the um, 10 year plan consultation felt that the budget of 20 million you know, was eye-watering, I, and I, I evidenced that, you know, potentially it would only be 10 million, actually, with Waka Kotahi funding. Um, but is there scope to, in this, actually reduce the amount it costs to... I don't know do how many it? times this has to be said, but the, the budget is set by council. Yes. Decisions around amending the budget can be made by council. OK. If I could just say that the final bullet point in paragraph 22 goes exactly to this point, scale of resources and timeframes. So depending on the outcome of the various consultation with key stakeholders with mana whenua, where we get to will be brought back to, count to the committee in November and that will include a, a discussion on resourcing. Okay, thanks Sandy. Councillor Pope. Has indicated a willingness to move. Have questions still, though? Question, Luf uh, question. My goodness, Councillor Lofiso. I was supposed to be in willingness to Ah, we're all reaching similar point in the afternoon. It seems we've exhausted questions. Councillor Benson Pope, would you like to speak to it? Yeah, thank you. I think as uh, as Dr. Hazelton, Hazelton just confirmed um, around the genesis of the project that. It, it was alive before Mr Van Brandenburg came along. Um, I, I'm sure history will show us that um, one of the many losses to the city 
uh, as a result of COVID has been the development that will one day happen over the other side. Um, indeed, I've no idea what the university is planning, but clearly uh, a hotel on the waterfront that was a, poss a, a definite possibility um, was never going to eventuate once um, the disease took hold and we locked down. But that hasn't changed anything in respect of the, the need for a safe link across the rail line on that alignment or something like it. One of the issues that was highlighted in the discussion earlier about the roading is the very real issue we have with separation across um, whatever alignment we decide for our roads. It's an issue with both sides of the hospital at the moment. It's an issue with um, the roadway outside Toitu and it's an issue with um, the roadway outside the railway station. Uh, and the more alternate access we can provide by whatever means, including in this case, some sort of overhead um, pathway, um, the better for the safety of our residents, uh, the safety of drivers as well actually, and also um, the safety of people who want to get to the waterfront for whatever reason. Don't forget this council has approved a development of very, very significant uh, in terms of the population, uh, the number of um, people in the accommodation in the London Mercantile Building just a few months ago, and that building is being built as we speak, substantially, significantly progressed already on two levels of the building. So there are going to be a lot more people in that immediate era, area wanting access safely into the Queen's Gardens area. I've no idea what the staff are going to come up with around costings, configuration, design or anything else, uh, but uh, I look forward to seeing what they will come back to us with in terms of the recommendation around timing that's in the clause of this report the Chief Executive has already drawn our attention to. Thank you. Councillor Officer. Tinako, Your Worship, uh, I would just like to start by acknowledging at the time in 2018 when we started or 2017 when we started um, our LTP preparation. Um, His Worship at the time, Dave Cull, explained to me as a first uh, term councillor how to approach this in consideration because I said there were people who couldn't afford to get to town to get to a, such a bridge. And uh, he said you support the resolution or you support the, the mood, the project, and then you go out to consult your community. Um, so I just, I just want to um, acknowledge uh, Mr. Cole uh, for the vision, and I even personally, while I may have had some reservations about the expenditure, I understood the vision and I understood the importance of the harbour to Mana Whenua. So I see this very much as a progression of relationships between us and mana whenua who have been patiently waiting for us to get our act together to work with them in real and sustained ways. I, so I acknowledge the staff, uh, current and past, and in particular, I'd like to acknowledge the blood, sweat and tears of Ms Pinfold when she was preparing well, she was instrumental for drawing together that business case for PGF funding, which didn't come through because of um, central government's meanness, but just killed us to everyone. Councillor Elder and Councillor O'Malley and Councillor Houlihan. Kia ora. Thank you for that. Um, I do actually, um, I'm excited about uh, mana whenua having a, a part in this project and particularly when it comes to the design I think um, to why the water and um, how it connects with the whenua is, is, is really really interesting and I, I'd imagine that that input in the design will actually enhance and um, enable the story to be told and I'm looking forward to that, it's really exciting. Councillor Milley. Thank you, Bishop. Um, yeah, I think this is exciting. I think 
increasing the role of mana whenua was a requirement for this to be successful, to be honest. I just want to comment on the other bridge options. The span's actually twice as wide if you go off those bridges because they are on the other side of the one-way system and have to go over the whole of the shunting yards of the railway line. It's a gigantic bridge to, to come across there and then it can't, it can't clear the down ramp on the eastern side of the existing road bridge. So that's largely why it's existed because it's engineeringly impossible to build it. Thanks. Councillor Houlihan. Um, yes, I, I can understand building this bridge if we were going ahead with the harbour development, which at the moment my understanding is we're not. And I made the assumption, rightly or wrongly, probably by the, given it's now paper here, it was obviously wrongly at the time, but I made the assumption at that meeting that this was also on hold because I thought it was part of this whole project. So that is was my assumption and that was my belief. So I am quite frankly shocked we're considering 20 million for this bridge when it would go to nothing at the moment because there'll be no development there. I understand planning for the future and I think it's great to engage with mana whenua on things but surely we can't look at this until we've got a better financial situation, we have plans in, in, in place for the harbour and then we can look at putting this in. My understanding is that this bridge would only take cyclists and walkers anyway. I mean, $20 million at a time, I'd like to say post-COVID, but it's not post-COVID. It is, we're still in COVID um, around the world. Obviously, we are privileged here. But, you know, at a time when our debt ceilings are high, uh, people are really hurting, and rates, we're asking people to pay 98 percent in our first year on our rates, which I've had so many people contact me say, please, you can't do that to us. I cannot vote for this. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I believe and, and remain of the view that this is a, a very important project and link. Uh, and the involvement of mana whenua is a given as far as I'm concerned, but it is a it continues to be a, a, an extremely important project because once the peninsula connection is completed, the State Highway 88 uh, around the harbour, um, that link to the harbour is going to be pivotal. It's part of us being a thriving city. Uh, it completes uh, that route and um, in terms of linkage remains pivotal. And continuing this idea um, that it will go to nowhere is simply uh, disingenuous. Councillor Reddick. Uh, yes, I'm concerned that at this stage of the piece the bridge will be going to nowhere, although it will connect up to that harbour connection in the fullness of time. And I think and given the uh, very uh, large amount of debt that we are taking on in this budget and the large increase in rates that we're having in this budget, this project should be put on hold and moved into the next 10-year plan at this stage. So I'd like to uh, propose an amendment or an addition to the resolution that it gets deferred till the next 10-year plan. I'll be counter to this. Um Yep. Resolution, so you could so do that, you could move that should this fail. I'll move that should this fail, so yes, a subsequent motion. Yep. Thank you. Um, I, I can support this. I, I do find it extraordinary, though, that elected members can find themselves shocked that this work is happening when on the 14th of December last year, less than six months ago, council moved to note that staff will work with Mana Whenua and other stakeholders to review the scope of the project to ensure it meets broader aspirations for the city, etc. Votes in favour, including uh, Councillor Raddock and, and, and Councillor Houlihan, it was carried 14 to one. Um, it speaks to a broader concern uh, if the result of the resolution is being taken by council um, appears to shock the supporters of the resolutions that triggered that work. I think um, a lot of the debate three years ago when this went through the 10-year plan process focused on the harbour side of the bridge and what might happen uh, around this construction 
as a catalyst for private development or educational facilities or, or whatever. Uh, personally, uh, I'm, I'm more excited about um, thinking about it in reverse uh, as a connection from the harbour into the city. Uh, and anybody who thinks that's nowhere um, hasn't been to that part of the city in, in some time. Uh, it has seen significant private investment uh, and is, uh, is one of the most stunning parts of our city centre. It's why it was prioritised in the central city plan to be the first work that we did from an urban design uh, and urban development perspective, uh, to, to, to say nothing of the significant uh, civic investment in the redevelopment of, of Toitu, uh, the Otago Settlers Museum, and, and earlier that of the, of the Chinese gardens, also down in, in that part. So I think connecting you know, recreational users of the harbour and around the harbour, and that's been mentioned already, how you know, that'll be a world-class recreational asset that this project will facilitate a connection between users of that space uh, and, the, uh, and the city proper. Uh, it is also a significant uh, connection point for mana whenua, uh, between the harbour itself uh, and, and what is now known as the exchange where uh, the stone acknowledging the Tauraka Waka sit. Uh, and, and I think there's a really exciting opportunity that we perhaps had glided over in earlier discussions around what this could look like uh, to tie together uh, looking at that space historically and, and, and culturally and socially and, and tying it back, uh, back to the harbour, how you manage um, that uh, and a public toilet uh, and Cargill's monument uh, remains to be seen, but those are all uh, discussions that we can have in, in, in due course. And I think regardless of uh, what may or may not happen on either side of, of this connection point, uh, it will be um, a fine asset for the, the city. And I welcome the work uh, that has been done to go back and look at how it can meet a, a broader set of objectives than perhaps uh, it, it, it did in its uh, earlier iteration. Councillor Benson Pope. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. I did ask the question earlier about um, how many councillors voted for it, and it was 15 nil. We all know that we often see 14 1 votes around this council table, so I would like to reiterate 15 nil. I. Um, do not consider it to be a bridge to nowhere. We are the wildlife capital of New Zealand and the harbour is an extremely um, important part of that. I also recommend the work with the mana whenua and Tautoku to um, Tahu Portuki's work. I think I was looking back just, just now to some of the work of the nar cultural narrative that's been going on as usual with council projects for a very, very long time. So I actually look forward to... Um, Sorry? Cal? Point of order, Councillor Houlihan. The reason I'm calling a point of order is I remember that vote and I remember you why were, I voted for it. Were, and and the, reason, the reason is that the things Councillor Parker is saying are not, are not correct. Yeah, tala le tai. It's not if you correct. Say more language week. Uh, councillor, the, councillor Barker is referencing the vote taken during the 10 year plan three years ago to put the project in our capital works program which was carried by 15 votes to nil. In 2018. In 2018. Okay. Well, so we, I'm not going to uphold the point of order, not that it was one technically Okay, either. well, she made an, a point of emphasising 15 stop. nil and looking at all of us as yeah. if, Councilor, why you, didn't Councilor, we remember this vote? Councillor, you have spoken <sighs> enough and you weren't here to vote on that motion, nor was Councillor Barker three years ago. <laughs> Don't feel personally attacked by history that you weren't part of making. Councillor Barker, you can continue. Oh, I think I finished, thank you. Councillor Hall. I was against the bridge and I was going to vote against it, but uh, Councillor Benson Pope put in that clause to a uh, maximum spend of $20 million, and that's the only reason I voted for it. Councillor Benson Pope, you're right of reply. Um, <clears throat> thank you, um, and thank you for those of you who um, have a vision that goes beyond Populism 101. I'd, I'd like to remind people where this is. It's right beside Toitu. It links also with the Queen's Gardens, potentially, and, and there are some developments that I've already alluded to happening right there as well, where people will be living. 
and wanting to access the other parts of the city. I think the Mayor has more than adequately responded to the road to nowhere nonsense, um, because whichever way you look, I quite like Portsmouth Drive and Anderson's Bay, and I also like the look of Queen's Gardens and the Warehouse Precinct and the Exchange. And I think you don't have to look past the Warehouse Precinct to look at the confidence that a number of our building owners and developers think of what the terminus looks like now, by the way. Uh, a lot of local owners uh, have, done, have done with their buildings in that whole precinct. Dr Hazelton's gone, unfortunately, because we know the role that he played in the <coughs> revitalisation of that part of our town. Um, so thank you to those of you who have a motivation of getting things done. And I'm sorry that those of you sitting at the table whose focus is constantly on trying to stop things happening uh, are actually in our midst. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Division. Oh, God. Take it by division. Just a reminder, we're voting whether or, whether or not to note a report uh, and the next steps for the project. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Councillor Elder? Yes. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Hall? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? No. Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? No. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Walker? Aye. Councillor Wiley? Oh, yes. Your Worship? He said yes. Oh, he's just been there. <laughs> I hope. I hope. <laughs> Carried 12 2. Thank you. And in the most keenly anticipated uh, vote of the day, I'm going to move that we adjourn the meeting until 9 o'clock tomorrow. Seconded Councillor Elder by acclamation. Uh, those in favour? Those against? That is agreed. Thank you.